Good evening, everybody. And uh, welcome to the platform in Morecambe, and welcome to an evening with Eden. Great to see everybody here. Uh, such a, a packed audience, sold out audience for this a very special event, which I'm sure you're all going to enjoy. And by the end of it, hopefully, you're going to know a little bit more than you do now, or hopefully a lot more than you do now, about the plans for the Eden Project North in Morecambe. This, e this evening has been brought to you by the Morecambe Business Improvement District, or Morecambe Bid. And we have a panel of experts for you this evening who are going to explain the benefits that the project will bring to the town and give you an insight to the current, into the current status of the project. And they're also here to answer your questions as well. This is how the itinerary for the evening is going to go. Each of our guest speakers will talk to you about different aspects of the project that they are the expert in, in that field. Uh, we will have a short intermission after four of our experts have spoken, and then after the interval we'll have two more talks. And then it will be your chance to ask the panel any questions that you may have as well. So, uh, let's get our first speaker up without any further ado. And first of all, we'd like to welcome, um, I, guess, I guess, yeah, I've got, I'm going to call him the main man behind the plans to bring the Eden Project to Morecambe. He spent a lot of time in Morecambe over the past uh, year and, and doing a lot, a lot of talks and always speaks very passionately, very compellingly, and I'm sure tonight will be no exception. He's going to give you an overview of where things stand right now with the Eden Project North plans. He's the head of Eden Project International. Uh, please give a big round of applause for Cy Bellamy OBE. Wow. Oh, there we go. Well, it's always nice to start a presentation by knowing you're a super sub for Craig Charles, so let's do that first of all. And then the second one is knowing that none of the slides work, so this is great. Um, but I like it that way because the one thing we do well at Eden Project is making, and our, our whole team, we always tell each other, just do things that make you feel uncomfortable. Because if you feel comfortable, you really can't push the edge of what you think is possible. So right now, this is me doing just that. So, what an amazing time to live in Morecambe, what an amazing time to live in Lancaster, what an amazing time to be part of this incredible community in this county. There's a crackle in the air. There really is, and every single time I come to Morecambe, I feel it, and it's not just because today's been one of those days with crisp air, blue skies, wonderful sunshine, because I was here on the 10th of August when I was being blown sideways over there in the carnival, and what gray hair I have was, was out here. And it's not about the sense of Eden Project coming, because that is important, but it's about the sense of a community. It's about a community that's prepared to roll its sleeves up and say, we want this more than we've ever wanted anything else. And that is for one simple reason. As I was coming up from Cornwall, I got this sense in my mind that people say we have Morecambe in its heyday, Morecambe when it was in its heyday. Who the hell said any town has to have one heyday? A heyday is simply a point, a pinnacle, which you've achieved. And who's to say the next heyday for Morecambe isn't going to be bigger and better? And so I want to start this sense of what Eden means, what it means to me, it means to the team, and every single person that's helped us get this far, is the fact that Morecambe's past is remarkable, but Morecambe's future is even more remarkable. And it's because of the community, and it's because of this fantastic bay that's out there that's the inspiration for Eden Project North. So if you're with us, let's hear it now. Come on. So, I wouldn't be stood here um, today, and thank you so much as well, because um, I know I'm being kept to 15 minutes, and Dame Sue is looking at me, thinking, don't pinch my slot. Um, it's because, first of all, there are a number of you being here, it means that there's some incredible charitable work can be done. And I met somebody about a year ago called Jenny Latouche, she had an idea called Escape to Make, which is simply about connecting young people and making sure they were inspired to have a different future. Because without our young people in this community, all of it, there is no future. There really isn't. They are our future. So the other person and the other group that we want to support, and it's Eden's nomination, along I think with the University of Lancaster, Dame Sue, is your money tonight from those calendars. So please buy all of them. Goes to Jenny Natouche and Escape to Make, a wonderful charity that's got a fantastic future ahead of it. So thank you so much for them. <laughs> So, everybody's seen the picture. Can we have a show of hands? Who's seen the picture of what Eden North may look like as our concept? There we go, there it is. But what I'm not going to talk about that, 
what I'm going to talk about is we all know what it may look like, but I think you're all here to hear what's inside. What's it going to feel like? What's the big news? And I can't wait to tell you more about some of those things with some questions afterwards. But the first thing to say, and people often ask me, is why Morecambe? And you know Morecambe really, really well. And to me, it's really clear. But just so everybody knows why Eden Project was invited to come and work in Morecambe was because we had some wonderful support from Lancaster University, from Lancaster City Council, from Lancaster County Council, and the Local Enterprise Partnership that enabled us to start looking and wondering, was this feasible? Could we do it? Could I make this mic work? Um, was, this, was this feasible at all? And the answer came back in November last year. It absolutely was. And it was for a couple of reasons. If you look back at the remarkable past of, of Morecambe, and there's some brilliant people um, who can talk about the seaside resorts of the past and what it means, Morecambe has always been a place that people have come to in their droves to take air, to take holiday, to have, be entertained, to enjoy time with their families, to reconnect with each other, and in a sense to, I don't know, just feel better. In those days in the past, they didn't call it well-being. They didn't call it health and well-being. They just called it having a holiday. Um, and it was all inspired by coming to marvellous places such as this. But we looked at Morecambe Bay and we said, wow, if Eden Project is an educational charity, if we're a charity that really does believe in the power of people, if we really are a charity that believes in the power of transformation, this is the place to do it. And it's the place to do it because out there is the most remarkable bay. And so the whole project, as the first principle, is it's going to be absolutely rooted in Morecambe Bay. The ecology of the bay, the stories of the bay, what the bay means. And it's all of Morecambe Bay. And I was over in Grange over Sands this morning looking at Grange Lido, and for the first time ever for me, actually, looking back at Morecambe Bay, and it's still remarkable, every way you look at it, it's incredible. But we are inspired by Morecambe Bay. Absolutely, it's an incredible place, and all the designations that come from that. But the second one was more surprising. And <laughs> it came from looking at the ground in the, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the town hall and saw this wonderful mosaic. And underneath it, under the shield, it said, um, beauty surrounds and health abounds. And what is that? What does that even mean? Well, it really does mean for us anyway that where you connect with nature, where you have beautiful nature all around you with Morecambe Bay, with the Lake District, all the wonderful stuff you have, then health follows. That's what it means. Now, we're going to add one more thing to that, which is beauty surrounds, health abounds, and nature astounds. Because we are so passionate about the ability for humans to connect with nature in a really meaningful way, we want to bring that to life. And for us, that's the Eden ethos. That's what created Cornwall. And I'd love to show you some slides. Of that. I'm just going to point and pretend they're there. Um, that's what it means for us in Cornwall. And it's going to be the same thing here. But let's get to the point. So what's going to be inside? Well, the main thing is we've, we've started to work that Morecambe is famous because Morecambe Bay is made by the moon. And just bear with me on this one. So Morecambe is all about tidal flow. And if it's about tidal flow, it's about rhythms. And quite frankly, we're all guided by rhythms, rhythms in life. And when I travel far too much, then I know my rhythms go out of whack. But this bay, every 12 hours, tide comes in, tide goes out. The nutrients, the wildlife, the ecology, refreshed in all that time. And so we're going to bring that story to life. And so the first thing we're going to have is going to be an abundant environment, which we're going to, is the Bay Hall. And that, for us, is going to be called Above the Bay. And can I just take a show of hands of those who've been to Eden Project in Cornwall? That's a good enough number. So that's kind of the feel you're going to get from the Mediterranean biome, for those that have been there. It's that kind of notion of perpetual spring. So when you're in August and it's freezing cold, didn't I say January, but August and it's freezing cold, you're getting blown sideways, you can go to a place that you just feel amazing. You can take your jacket off. It is perpetual spring. It's abundantly planted. But likewise, you can look around you and see beautiful, lush, green environment. I'll come back to that in a moment. But also, you're going to have some immersive experiences that can really start sensitizing you and helping people understand just what's outside the window. So that's the first part, above the bay. And it's going to be guided, I guess, by the kind of solar cycles and linking into that first cycle of life. Well, if we've got above the bay, then you guessed it, there's a below the bay part. And that isn't we're going to get down and deep into the sands. We might do some of that too, of course. But that's really about bringing to life the moon, the lunar cycle, and actually being quite playful. 
So one of the things we've never done before at Eden Project is to start to be theatrical, to use the best of immersive technologies to bring that to life in a way that people have never seen. We're working with some pretty cool co corporations and companies, and we're really excited to create those immersive experiences. One of them's called Marshmallow Laser Feast. I won't go into the others. Um, but they're brilliant people, and we can't wait to create this theatrical set from which having this theatre of people and plants to be able to show what's below the bay with the ecology. And why is that important? Because if we truly are an educational charity, and if we truly are to connect people to Morecambe Bay, we've got to try and help them understand it in ways they've never seen. Because one of the things we're passionate about is if people care, then, and they understand, you will then look at the world outside you with more curious eyes. And if you're more curious about what you see, and you understand it more, you might take some action. And that action may be quite subtle, or that action might be quite forceful, who knows? All we know is we have got 10 years to respond to the climate emergency. We've got 10 years to do something about these tipping points that our planet is going through. And another reason why we can't wait for this project because it just simply has to happen to make sure the messages of the importance of our planet get rammed home as much as we can do to make sure we offer people the opportunity to understand. And back to the third point, really, which is about if we've got above the bay and below the bay, we've got another element, which is about education. And the education part we're calling our natural observatory. And that's a means, quite simply, for people to observe and to, and to sense and to learn. And that's at the lowest level with early years children, and Wes is going to go through some of that, I'm sure, from Lancaster and Morecambe College, right up to PhD, PhD students and everybody in between. A sense of a living laboratory that people can explore and understand. Because the three principles for us at Eden about transformation are about economic transformation. Well, we all know that when Eden is part of the community here, we hope everybody's going to benefit in terms of economic growth, and that includes jobs and hope and lots more besides. But we also know there's a social transformation that comes from it by bringing communities together. There's already a fantastic community, but if Eden was a person, how could we be a valued part of that community and by invitation do things with Morecambe alongside you? And the final part of that is about making sure that education is about transforming people's understanding. And therefore, the overriding thing for Eden Project North is making sure that people understand the Bay better than they've ever understood it before. So that involves harnessing the best we can involve, which is working with people here, I think, from Lancaster University, Lancaster and Morecambe College, but so many more people besides, school teachers, wherever you are, to come in and use Eden Project North as a convening place to learn, to understand, and quite frankly, have an amazing time and have fun doing so. So I think I'm probably coming to a bit of my limit of time. I'm checking people now. Um, but the final thing I was going to say, really, and back to my, my kind of starting point of this crackle in the air, hopefully you can tell how passionate I am about this, but it's not just me that's passionate, because the whole Eden team are passionate, because this is really important to us. We had a community consultation about four weeks ago, and again, I love doing the show of hands. How many people came to the community consultation events, the conversations? A few of you, hopefully some more will. Um, and two and a half thousand people told us that you wanted Eden Project to come. But even more of you said, we can't wait for you to come quicker, you know, get here as quick as you can. And we really are doing that. So the other reason I've come up today is also to just say the whole of the Eden team is working hard as we can to make this happen. It is going to happen, because some people, every time I get in a taxi, they say, is this project going to happen? And the answer is, yes, it is. And the reason I can say so unequivocally, yes, it's going to happen, is because when I look to my left and my right and I see people around us in the project, we know that they're all with us in a way that has humility, in a way that is honest, in a way that says we're with you because we're working really hard alongside you, not just saying but doing. And that means a heck of a lot because building a project like an Eden project, there's only ever been one. That was it. I'm pointing again at the thing that isn't there. Um, that was it. And in order to do that, it needed every single sinew of someone's body and a team's body. And the best things in life are always done as a team. So my final rallying call is, are you part of this team? Because we really need every single one of you to go and talk to your friends, your family, and to talk about this project and to make it happen. Because the government may give us some money, some other people may give us some money, but when this really happens, every single member of this community needs to come together to say, this is our project, this is Morecambe's project, and it's Morecambe Bay's project, and we want it to happen. We're going to rely on you. You can rely on us to give our best at all times. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure talking to you. There we go, and I can't wait to listen to your questions. Hi, everybody. Don't disappear, Sai. 
Come on, come on, come on. We're going, to go, we're going to have a talk in what I call the parking zone. Oh, amazing. Zone. Wow, the, here we go. The parky zone. Um, yeah, I mean, brilliant, brilliant speech. Very passionate, as always. Uh, it was really interesting, actually, uh, when you asked people, have they been to the Eden Project in Cornwall? And, and probably about half people put their hands up. But for the people who haven't been, and obviously you hear a lot of talk about the Eden Project, Eden Project, Project North, but just in very basic terms, what is there at the Eden Project in Cornwall? What, what actually is it? Ooh. Oh, and finally, there may be works. movement. <laughs> <laughs> wow, John. Better late, better late than never. Well, uh, I mean, the main thing is Eden was inspired by the transformation of a clay pit. So before I even go what's in it, it's important to go, what was it? It was a clay pit, and it needed a post-industrial use. And in looking at the site, Tim Smith and others in their madness said, wouldn't it be great to create the largest indoor rainforest in captivity? Not that the rainforest can walk away, of course, but that was the mindset. And so that inspired some architecture with Grimshaw, which I continue to work with us brilliantly, to create these biomes, these, in, these, these huge greenhouses. And the reason I say that is that was responsible for the topography of the site, the fact this bowl had been created, and it enabled the rainforest to be placed inside a 52-metre biome and enable that rainforest to flourish. It also then enabled another environment, which was a Mediterranean environment to flourish. And again, that could bring uh, to life different regions around the world, such as Australia gardens, South Africa gardens, and Mediterranean gardens. So the main focus of, e of Eden Project in Cornwall was to connect people with plants. And if you look back at 1999, 2000, um, the main narrative was about uh, deforestation, loss of rainforest, climate change. It would, people were sensitized to that, but if you look back now, in the last 20 years, this is now even more important than it's ever been. And so the main part of Eden Project is effectively these two major iconic parts, which is the rainforest and the Mediterranean biome. But beyond that, then, we've got elements such as the core, which is a means of fusing a cultural destination with art and science and performance. And the whole of Eden Project as well. Hopefully you're aware it's a... We've got a, uh, another group within us called um, Eden Project Sessions. So we have six sessions a year, and we've been ranked by NME as one of the best stages in the world next to Glastonbury's Pyramid Stage. So we put on some pretty big gigs. Um, no disrespect to Craig Charles, but he's, um, <laughs> we've, we've got some plans to, to try and make sure that we're up there again bringing the best of Eden. So if I was to answer it really simply, is to say Eden's an attitude, and part of that is making sure people can connect with nature and science and art, wonderful food and community, and all that comes together in this wonderful caution that's called our site in Cornwall. And you just touched on it there again, just, just last question. It's, it's a 4,000-seater concert venue. Is that right, that you're, you're looking to, is. The, the to Eden, build as part of the Eden Project North in Morecambe? Yeah, when I say seater, it, um, those who've been Capacity. to Cornwall know we're, we're, we're a bit of a kind of a bowl, and one thing we also like to do is to make sure people feel part of nature. So even in saying that, if we're providing a concert or performance space, then we want to do the same thing here. So at times, that might be able to uh, accommodate 4,000 people in terms of a performance and a concert. At other times, it could be an enormous workshop. You could hear people giving speeches. You could have den building workshops, stuff for kids, stuff for all ages. So we tr that site out there is pretty tight. And so we've got to make sure that every single part of that site is flexible, enables us to do the things that we think are, well, guided by the people that want to do things with us. Okay, well, we'll have the opportunity to ask a few more Brilliant. questions, as indeed the audience will, to you later on, Si. Uh, everybody, please uh, give Thank a big round so of applause much. to really Si Bellamy. Thank you. Now, uh, so you've heard from uh, uh, the main man at uh, uh, Eden Project International. Uh, now let's hear from some other people who are uh, connected, who are kind of forming partnerships and relationships with the Eden Project as they begin their groundwork here in Morecambe. And first of all, to talk a little bit about uh, building well-being in the community and how that fits in to, uh, or how Eden fits into that, please welcome the Executive GP of Lancashire North Clinical Commissioning Group, Dr. Andy Knox. Hello, everybody. It's a real privilege to be here this evening, and I've started my timer because uh, I'm uh, known for waffling on. Um, so great to be here. I'm going to be talking this evening about the partnership between the NHS and also our other public sector organizations and Eden, and how together we might build more wellness in society. Now, I'm really interested by three questions. Why? What 
and how. Why does wellness and health matter? Well, in 19th century France, there was a philosophical battle royale between two great giants of the scientific world. On one side, we had Louis Pasteur, pasteurization of milk. He said that we must create health by preventing disease and killing disease. On the other side of the argument was Antoine Béchamp. He said, no, I disagree. If we're going to be well, we must create environments that help us to be well. If we do that, then illness will be far from us. Well, Pasteur won the argument. And for the last 150 years, we've been thinking about health in terms of how we prevent people getting unwell and how we make them better once they are unwell. And we've achieved some amazing things together as a result. We've seen mass immunization. We've seen the advent of antibiotics and the development of chemotherapy, to name just three. But I think Bichamp might ask us whether or not we are truly well. You see, here in Morecambe Bay, if you live in Overkellet and walk the six miles down the wild and rugged coast into the heart of Morecambe, your life expectancy decreases by 15 to 16 years. We are currently facing quite a significant mental health crisis in our young people. We have an epidemic of type 2 diabetes. We have some really difficult and tough health issues that we're facing into. And in the NHS, we have declining staff morale and really high levels of staff burnout. And every three weeks, another one of our doctors nationally takes their own life. And so we might ask ourselves whether or not we are really, truly well. And yet here in Morecambe, where health is supposed to abound in this place that beauty surrounds and nature does indeed astound, it's really important that we see health and wellness both as a social justice issue as well as being a human rights issue. Surely it isn't okay that a child born in certain parts of this bay can expect to live in such poorer health for so much more of their life and then expect to die sooner than someone who could live just a couple of neighborhoods away. That's why this matters. So what might we do about it together and why does a partnership like Eden become so important? There's a fairly well-known saying in business, is there not, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Have you heard that? So I've become really fascinated in my work as Director of Population Health here in Morecambe Bay about how we create the kind of cultures that enable us to build wellness together. And I have to say that not just with Sai, but with so many other members of the Eden team, it has been amazing to find that the kind of culture that we're trying to create in the NHS, in the way that we work in the public sector here in the Bay, in the way that we're trying to work with our communities radically differently, we find the same heart connection, the same kind of culture in Eden. And I think there are five key foundation stones to that culture that we're trying to establish together that will allow us to build this kind of wellness back in society. And they happen to begin with the letters H, I, J, K, and L. The first is hope. You know, every morning when I listen to the news and when I switch on my TV to catch up on what's happening in this election cycle, there is much that makes me feel despairing and hopeless. There's so much that we're facing into in terms of the climate emergency that we find ourselves in and so many of the issues in our society right now that could easily lead to us feeling depressed and down. But hope is not built by focusing on everything that is wrong and on everything that is going terribly. Hope is found 
when we focus on what is possible despite the differences, despite the difficulties that we face. And one of the things that Eden brings to us right now in Morecambe Bay is a sense of hope. That together we really could create the kind of future in which people together can be well. The second thing that it does, and that I've loved watching in terms of how we're beginning to work together, is a sense of inclusivity. One of the greatest privileges of my work over the last few years has been to get involved in something called the Poverty Truth Commission. What that does is it takes people who have lived, who have, ex, who have kind of expertise in poverty through lived experience with those of us who have perhaps more strategic leadership positions, and it brings us together to really hear each other and listen to one another with a sense of humility and openness and kindness. And one of the things that I've seen most impact me, I think, is, is that sense of really needing to embrace a new humility, that we don't know what other people live in and with until we're willing to encounter them and hear their stories. And one of the things that I've seen Eden do again and again in consultations is they've really come and they've listened to people in this bay. They've been people who've had the humility to say, tell us the story of your lives. Tell us what's really going on in the communities here. And not then just come and plonked a model on the top of it and said, we're going to do this to you. It's really been a sense of partnership, of inclusivity, of togetherness that says, you know what, how do we find a way through together? How do we build something that involves all of us, that is for all of this community, no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what your background, no matter what your starting place? That is a beautiful culture. It's something we could all learn from together. And there is a there's, a, there's an aboriginal saying that is that I cannot be well unless you are well. We have to find that back in our communities, that, that sense of really knowing that I can't be well if the person a few streets away is not well. That regrowing of community together is something we must rediscover if we're going to build wellness back into our communities. Thirdly, it means joy. Helping one another reconnect with our passions, who we are as human beings, is something truly amazing and beautiful. Many of you will have heard over the last number of months this whole idea of social prescribing. That lots of times people come and see me as a GP, and sometimes I sit there and I wish that there was something I could do for the person. But a lot of the time people come looking to the doctor for a bit of help, and there is no help necessarily to give. But the idea of social prescribing is to help people connect back with their raw passions, what keeps them healthy and well in the first place. And it's one of the things that I'm so glad that Eden are massively involved with and, and open up a whole realm of possibilities for us in how we connect people back to their passions. What makes them a human being? If we could create that sense of joy, you know, last night I had the, the real joy of conducting Carnforth Community Choir. As a surgery, we chatted with over a thousand people in our town about five years ago. And we said, what would help us be more healthy and well as a town? And consistently people said, you know, we want a place to sing together. And now every Monday night, 100 people together from three generations, from the age of seven through to 95, get together and we sing. And last night we gave a concert at Carnforth Community School. And we had an amazing evening together, singing. The stuff that brings us joy in the life keeps us healthy and well. Fourthly, we need to create the kind of culture that is kind. When I was training as a doctor, I walked into um, my tutorial one day and let out a big sigh. And my tutor, being a very nice and kind and responsive person, said, oh, Andy, what is wrong? What's wrong? And I said, oh, I said, oh, I've just had one of those real heart sink patients. You know, the kind of person that just walks into your room and... They just come back again and again with the same problem and nothing ever changes. And she said, whoa. She said, let me stop you right there. 
She said, if your heart sinks when a person comes into your room, the problem is not with the person, it's with your heart. She said, get a bigger heart. She said, be kinder. You don't get to look at someone else's life and judge them because you've never walked in their shoes. You have never lived their life. You do not have to walk back into their life when they leave your room. How much more beautiful is it when we have a society that is kind to one another, that believes the best of one another, that wants the best for one another? And I see that kindness in Eden and in the way that they work. And it's part of the culture that we need to rediscover together in such a time of, of opposition and adversary. And then, lastly, and I unashamedly use this word, and it, it may be embarrassing to some of you, but I believe we have to have a culture that is full of love. It is our foundation stone. It is the reason why we get out of bed in the morning. It is the thing that enables us to know that we belong in the world, that we are seen, that we are valued just for who we are. Love is the beginning and it is the end. It is the thing that allows us to forgive one another when things get wrong. My work in Sierra Leone after the genocide there taught me that. My work in South Africa after apartheid taught me that. We have to be people who can forgive against the odds if we're going to discover the kind of society together in which we can all be well. And so, how do we do it? We know why we need it, because right now there's so much injustice and there's so much hurt. We know that we need to do it by changing our culture, but how? What are we going to do? Well, there's a great thinker called John Paul Lederach who, who's written a book called The Moral Imagination. And he says that if we're going to change society together, if we're really going to see a social movement of wellness back in society, there are two things that we need to take really seriously. He says, changing culture in society and building well-being through society, you can think of it as a spider spinning a web. But for a spider to spin a web, it needs anchor points. So I suppose what I'm asking, and what I believe Eden is, is one of those anchor points. But Eden alone is not enough. It takes those of us who work in the NHS, in the council, in business, in all kinds of different areas of life together here in this bay to recognize that the institutions we work in become anchors for a new kind of society together, a kinder, more well society. And so I'm asking you to think about how your own organization becomes its own anchor point to create this kind of culture, this wellness together in society. But the other thing Lederach talks about is what he calls critical yeast. It takes less people than you think, but it takes people. And it takes you as an individual being willing enough to be a catalyst for change in your environment. When you look at a loaf of bread, you don't see or even necessarily taste the yeast, but boy, do you see its effect. If Eden is going to be a success in Morecambe Bay, and if we are going to build a kind of society together that really brings about change, not only do we need anchor points within our own institutions to be that change, we need to make sure that we as individuals become those people of critical yeast who explode this kind of culture together where we are. You see, alone, we cannot create wellness in society. But together, as we join on to one another and we take ourselves and our organization seriously in partnership with others, just like Eden, we really can create wellness back in our communities and in this society. Thank you. Dr. Andy Knox. Andy Jukes. Hi. I've been told to switch around. <laughs> Powerful speech there from, uh, from Dr. Andy Knox. Just, just one question I wanted to ask you, actually, Andy, mm. having, having listened to that, was... Um, 
when Eden happens, yeah. it's going to create a lot of employment yes. in our area, uh, both in terms of building it and also in terms of once it opens. Yeah. Um, do you see a link between um, greater employment in the Morecambe Bay area and greater well-being? Absolutely, I do. Um, you know, one of the, well, probably the biggest determining factor in health, in terms of an, a person's overall health and well-being, is poverty. So we need to create the kind of environments where people can work, and so people can be more well, because they're able to earn good salaries and good money. But you know, what that really depends on is a few things, because when we talk about work, we need to see work that pays, and pays a living wage. So it's really, really vital that if we're talking about work, and I really, it was one of the things that I love about Eden, is they're talking about the kind of work that really works for people and works for society. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so the kind of work that we must see is the work that enables people at the end of the day not to necessarily have to go and use a food bank because they can't afford to feed their family. If people are going to work, they need to be able to then afford to live. Uh, and so work in and of itself isn't enough. Work that allows you to live becomes the thing that builds capacity for wellness. And so that's what we must really hear together. How do we take responsibility? And you know, one of the other things I've loved, recently that I heard um, Oldham Council have done some work around uh, who they employ. And so they did a survey of all the people that they employ as a council, and they found out of the few thousand staff that they employed that only nine of them were from their most deprived communities. And so what they've done is they've taken positive action to actually deliberately find employment for people who live in their poorest communities. And what that means is that you then begin to drive up economic well-being because you're making positive choices. So you're not necessarily looking to, you're, you're, you're growing your own. And so this is where we really can, as employers, take a massive role in building the economy and building wellness at the same time. So creating work that pays well, but then deliberately choosing to enable people to find employment from areas that are often ignored. And if we do that, that, that double whammy um, creates an incredible new kind of economy that allows real wellness to, to be created. Well, yep, I'm sure everybody here would like to see that happen. Uh, Dr. Andy Knox, everybody. In case you're wondering why, um, everybody remember Blockbusters, the TV quiz show? Where you, yeah, you may remember that uh, on Blockbusters, uh, everybody, uh, the contestants brought a mascot. Well, this is, this is Gully. This is the Morecambe Bid seagull mascot. And... Uh, it's, so seagulls uh, aren't always, um, <laughs> sometimes they're lovely, sometimes they're, they're not so lovely, but, but Gully's nice and cuddly, isn't it? And uh, I believe that there's a, a, a more cam, more cam, a webcam where Gully's involved in, with more can bid. Normally you're sitting on camera and looking through. That's right, which you can, which you can watch via the, via the web, via the more can bid website. So yeah, look out, look out for that. It gives you some great views of the, the bay. So uh, next to speak about the tourism benefits of Eden Project North, Please welcome a Senior Lecturer in Tourism at the University of Central Lancashire, Dr. David Jarrett. Thank you. Cheers. Good evening, everyone. Um, firstly, thanks to John for inviting me here tonight. Cheers, John. Although I did notice he put me straight after two very inspiring speakers, so <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> okay, right. Um, the reason I'm here, hopefully this works. Uh, there we go. Uh, the reason I'm here tonight um, is because I've been doing research into Morecambe, specifically um, tourists to Morecambe, why their visits, uh, why they visit, and their impressions, their sense of place of, of Morecambe Bay. Oop, going ahead of myself. Okay, as I'm sure many of you know, um, Morecambe is a, an, a 19th century resort that, that boomed in the 20th century. Um, I was reading a, a guidebook a couple of days ago. Oh, it's playing games with me, just one sec. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll keep talking. You can guess which slide <laughs> matches it. Um, so, an 1899 guidebook described Morecambe as having the best water supply in England. Um, it's two degrees warmer than the south of England and has a longer than average lifespan. 
So we can take that with a pinch of uh, sea salt, but um, I, it, it's clear that wellness <laughs> has... Uh, Wellness has always been at the, the, the heart of Morecambe and uh, what it offers, uh, as well as entertainment. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm going to be battling with this, I think. So it boomed in the 20th century, and um, okay, I think that's better actually. Um, um, and uh, Bingham, Roger Bingham, marks the height of Morecambe's popularity as 1949. The, the, the switch on night with uh, 100,000 visitors or so. Uh, Morecambe very much saw a post-war boom. Uh, you can see there, I think you've seen it several times, the, uh, <laughs> the picture of the uh, swimming stadium. Let's go. The super swimming stadium, which was the uh, largest Lido in Europe at the time. Okay, but it wasn't to last. Um, I'm not going to focus on this too much because it strikes me that this is a, an evening of positivity. But um, Morecambe saw quite a remarkable decline from a tourism point of view. Um, not least um, due to the, the, the loss of the tourism infrastructure. I, I made a quick list. Uh, obviously a theme park, two piers, a revolving tower, swimming stadium, oceanarium, the Royalty Theatre, the Alhambra and, and various others as well. And there is a quote which is flashing around somewhere. There we go, from Hassan, um, who says that Morecambe, um, spending in Morecambe, visitor spending in Morecambe, dropped from 46.6 million in 1973 to just 6.5 million in 1990. That's a pretty catastrophic uh, drop. Okay, so you're ahead of me, I know, but uh, it's, uh, well, what were the uh, reasons for this decline? Um, well, competition is the one that's often uh, cited um, the story you'll read in the media most often is that in the 1960s we all stopped going to Morecambe and places like Morecambe started to go to Spain and Greece. And of course there is some truth in that. Um, uh, the more affluent members of society were starting to go on those holidays in the 1960s. But for most ordinary Brits it wasn't until the late 70s, early 80s that those holidays became prevalent. Um, so really when we say competition... Um, we are really talking about uh, Blackpool, and we are places like the Lake District, especially once we move from the, the age of the train into the age of the car and people go anywhere on holiday. Uh, we're talking about infrastructure loss, which I, I mentioned before. Uh, transportation and location was another issue, um, because, because more com compared to other Lancastrian resorts is relatively remote. Um, if you think about where the, the high populations in the northwest are and the other seaside resorts are, uh, you have to go further to get to Morecambe. Uh, there was pollution and the perception of dirty beaches, and there was some justification for that. Uh, socioeconomic problems, which have, we've uh, touched on today already. Uh, image problems. Um, some of you might remember Colin Crompton from the 1970s, who had whole stand-up routines about Morecambe, just, just Morecambe. Uh, Morecambe, the place where seagulls don't land anymore, was one of his quotes. <laughs> uh, maybe that's changing. Um, so... Yeah, it had all kinds of uh, image problems which persisted really until uh, quite recently. And essentially, Morecambe fell out of fashion. Um, taste changed, society changed. Uh, society became more aspirational. Uh, John Urry from Lancaster University used to talk about a, a leisure spaces hierarchy. Um, and uh, places like Morecambe used to be towards the top of that hierarchy. But of course, uh, then um, other leisure spaces became popular, not just seaside resorts, but lots of others uh, within the UK and abroad, and places like Morecambe start to slip down that hierarchy. Okay. And this is probably one of the most famous uh, tourism models. It's the Tourist Area Life Cycle by Butler, 1980. And essentially, it's the product life cycle uh, rebadged. And uh, the theory is that towns, the uh, resorts in particular, go through a life cycle of growth and then stagnation, and then something needs to happen at that high point there, and if it doesn't, uh, decline sets in. There is a certain inevitability about this, um, we, and, and Sai touched on this earlier when he says he says that, uh, you know, that towns have to have just one heyday, and I would agree with that. And more recently, people have begun, begun to question this, uh, Sai also mentioned Grange over Sands, a place that has never really been subject to this. 
So I think now in tourism uh, studies, we are be be beginning to move beyond this and take a more nuanced approach. Uh, and I think it's also fair to say, and this is where it starts to get a bit more positive, that the seaside is coming back. Those, those tastes, um, those uh, changes in society we mentioned earlier are now favorable to the seaside. So before I go through these, just a few facts and figures. Uh, the Brits are taking more domestic breaks now than they've ever taken. Um, and according to uh, Visit England, the seaside accounts to 37% of all British holidays. Um, and, th and that is the highest category. Uh, the countryside um, attracts 48 uh, uh, million visitor nights, whereas the seaside annually attracts 72 million. So um, the media reports of the death of the seaside are very much exaggerated. And we can see here what's involved with uh, selling seaside resorts today. Um, obviously, standards need to improve. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues facing resorts like Morecambe was that drop in standards, say accommodation in, in particular. Um, so, so we definitely need to be on top of that. Programs of events, um, I'll come back to that later, but it, 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 I mean, Morecambe is, is, is doing well with it, its events. Uh, and of course, in, in the past, it had WOMAD and uh, other things. Art and culture as tools of regeneration. Uh, we, we can see this uh, throughout the country, not just at the seaside, is that people are now beginning to see the value, the economic value of um, art and culture. Basically, if you have culture, then you, you have tourism. Um, seaside heritage itself, which wasn't taken all that seriously even a few years ago, is becoming increasingly valued. You just need to look at what historic England have been doing over the last uh, 15, 20 years or so. And they have been cataloguing the seaside uh, heritage. And I know Vanessa's gonna tell us about the, uh, the winter gardens uh, later on. But we are beginning to take seaside heritage itself more seriously and just look at the rebirth of Lido's around the country and, and, and you can see this in action. Um, the, the seaside is being reinvented, not being torn down, uh, but it's, um, reinvented in a nostalgic way, using the seaside traditions and the, the places that made those uh, seaside resorts special um, to, to bring in a new uh, group of people. And younger people are beginning to discover the seaside, I think it's fair to say, but they do it in a slightly different way, often through events or eventing. Um, it's very important in tourism that you have a unique selling point. Um, I, I think Morecambe had that, it had its entertainment, it has had the bay. Um, it, it's always had that and always will. Um, but it, I think it's very important when we talk about the future of tourism that we always consider the USP the unique selling point. And on, on that last point there, it's, um, it's very important that we focus on the, the quality of, the, of tourism. Some people in the tourism industry would say the quality of the tourists, but I think a better way of um, explaining it is the quality of the tourism, the sorts of experiences we're offering people. We live in the experience economy now where people uh, value experiences, they're willing to pay for them, and people are actually prioritizing experience over more material possessions, much more now than they ever were, and much more the younger generations than, than anyone else. And I think if you do focus on that quality, you're giving people a reason to, to come here, and to, I think this is very important, to, to, to stay longer in Morecambe and, and spend more money whilst they're here. And the better quality of the offering, the more that that is, is going to happen. You do need a critical mass. Okay. It seems to be behaving itself now. We've got some nice pictures. Uh, I don't know if anyone's been to Margate, but um, in some ways you could compare the problems that Margate has had to the problems Morecambe's had from a tourism point of view. Um, the the uh, Turner Contemporary opened in 2011, and since then it's seen 3.5 million visitors. It, um, there's been a lot of case studies, a lot of research on this, on how uh, culture and art can turn things around. Uh, interestingly, uh, Wayne Hemingway from Morecambe uh, was actually involved with Dreamland there and, and reinventing Dreamland. And it's basically a nostalgic theme park where people go to reconnect with past rides, old-fashioned rides, old-fashioned amusement arcades. Um, so we're not reinventing the seaside. Sometimes we're uh, improving, reinvigorating might be a better way of putting it. 
Blackpool Museum. I'm going to uh, an event um, when they're opening the, uh, the, the branding of Blackpool Museum in January, so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, but this is due to open in 2021, Blackpool's first museum, and it's a museum of the seaside. So this, the idea is it's primarily a museum, obviously, about Blackpool, but it, it's going to be, uh, it's going to have elements uh, in there that will tell us the story of the seaside more generally. So that should be really exciting. Butlins. Um, Butlins is back. It's not just the seaside. Uh, Butlins are doing really well financially. Uh, the occupancy rate is very high. And their basic philosophy over the last few years um, has been to uh, sell the parents that your grandparents, sell the holidays, sorry, that your grandparents used to have, but better. So, so keep the nostalgic element, keep the traditions, keep the, uh, the entertainment, but uh, improve the standards so, and uh, incorporate wellness facilities and so on into those offerings. Um, it's not just Butlins. There are businesses all around uh, the, the British coast that are doing really well. Travelodge has opened up 55 seaside hotels in the last 10 years, and you can see that with Premier Inn and other companies as well. Okay, back to Morecambe. Uh, events, I mentioned the, uh, this before, events, really important part of the modern touristic offering, much more than in the past, arguably, because people want unique, bespoke, authentic experiences. And one of the most effective ways to deliver that in the experience economy is through a dynamic uh, program of events. Uh, Vintage by the Sea here uh, now attracts over 40,000, and, that, and that's a really uh, good number of people. The term project on the prom commenced in 94, I believe, and was completed by the end of the century. The Midland Hotel opened in 2008. So while you know, the, um, the gaps between these moments are longer than many people would like in terms of developing momentum, there, there is nevertheless a momentum and a improvement um, in tourism numbers since around 1999, 2000. Um, We've obviously now got better road links, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and we've got cleaner beaches, uh, largely due to EU uh, directives, it's got to be said. Um, however, um, Morecambe does still lack a major attraction, other than the promenade. OK, the future of Morecambe. OK. so. As you can see from that top paragraph there, we, we need to retain the heritage, the seaside heritage that we have. I think that's vital. When you look at the heritage that Morecambe has already lost, I think it's absolutely imperative that we retain what we've got. Um, I also think another aspect is, going back to unique selling points, is that we, we, we make um, Morecambe a unique and distinctive offering from a tourism point of view. That could be through events or attractions or a combination of both. We want to avoid the landscapes of uh, hometown Britain. And the final point there on this is that Morecambe was developed by people who took a chance and invested in the resort. And they did, did so because they had confidence in Morecambe. And I think it's absolutely vital that you know, we talk up Morecambe because place image is that, from a tourism point of view, there is nothing more important than, than place image. Because tourism really is about selling places. Okay, so, if you were to put on a tourist attraction in Morecambe, what would you go for? Um, well, I would argue something that reflects the attraction, the initial attraction of Morecambe Bay, uh, and that is the bay itself. You can see here a quote from uh, Johnson's Guide for the People, 1899. Uh, there is nothing strictly ancient about Morecambe except the land and the sea. And there is no doubt that these must ever remain the chief attractions of the place. And I think that has uh, proven to be true. Uh, here are some quotes from some um, tourists to Morecambe that I, I interviewed. Um, so the second one there says, looking across the bay, it's quite something. The final one, 
There's such beautiful sunsets and beautiful views that you can't help but be attracted to it and can't help but be affected by it. And this was remarkably consistent in um, my findings about Morpham. Okay, and I could talk about this all day, but don't worry, I'm not going to. Um, it's, uh, this, is, this is essentially a summary of um, my, my research into Morecambe, certainly the interview-based side of it. And if you look on the right-hand side there, you can see the tourist, and this is what they come to Morecambe with. So, for example, a desire for open, spra uh, open spaces and fresh air and to reconnect to something. Um, also, memories of playing here as children. Nostalgia is an incredibly important motivation, a motivator for uh, tourists. On the other side, we can see the place attributes of Morecambe, and they include uh, sea views, the, uh, the smell of the sea, the noise of waves crashing. Uh, they include heritage, places like the Winter Gardens. But if you see there on the left, there's an arrow impacting on that, and that is the sea or the space. I, I kind of wish I'd bagged that up as Morecambe Bay, really, because that would have been more accurate, seeing as this is a case study based on Morecambe. But basically, that was the the big thing that everybody talked about was the bay and how that impacted on the place. Uh, but on the other side is what they came here with. And in the middle is the sense of place. Um, this is what Morecambe means to people based on the research that I did, um, 2013 that was, by the way, and then uh, published later on. And I can summarize that up in, in, into three points, the sense of place at Morecambe, uh, or seasideness, if you prefer. Um, the first point was wellness. People, tourists, come here to feel better. They do feel better after they walk along the prom. And there's some interesting research on blue space and subjective well-being that suggests they're absolutely right. You feel better, you are better. Um, another one was a connection with nature, a connection with this vast space that makes us feel small. So at the same time, we feel connected to it, um, a spiritual element as well. And then finally, nostalgia. Nostalgia for people's own childhood, but actually a wider uh, collective social nostalgia for the seaside and what the seaside uh, means to us as a society as well. And all of this, all of those three elements were facilitated by um, the bay and the sea views. Which makes me think that a tourist attraction that reflects the bay, the reason why people already come here, the reason why people have always come here, um, is a win-win. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, David Yarrick. Yarrick, just like to take a quick seat, David. Just, just there, just there, just there, just there, just there. Just there, just there. Okay. <laughs> Just like to, I would just like to make it clear that the, the same technology for the slides will not be used when we do the Morecambe Christmas light switch on tomorrow. Because <laughs> we, we don't want Craig Charles flicking the switch out here and the lights going on in Barrow. Oh, so that, that won't be happening. I've definitely been seeing that now. You, 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 did, you, did, you did a great job, though, David. You, 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 you went through it. And I just, just want to talk numbers with you, just very, very quickly. Uh, but when we're talking tourism, in your research or in your professional opinion, an attraction like the Eden Project North, how many more people could that potentially attract to Morecambe? How much money could that be worth to the economy? Um, the, the honest answer is I haven't, I haven't got a number. <laughs> uh, I, I really don't know. I think you're going to have to ask Sai about the, um, uh, about the tourist attraction itself. I think what I've been focusing on more is place image. And um, I think while you will attract millions, no doubt, I think there's a more important point that it will be so important for the, the image of Morecambe, and that will bring in people more generally, but it will also bring in investment, people relocating here. I think it's, go, it, it's, it's going to be massive. I wouldn't like to put a, a number on it, especially as it hasn't even been built yet, but um, I think if you could uh, look at the numbers down in the southwest and extrapolate that to a, a smaller attraction. The, the only thing I would say is that with the new road and the bypass, you, you, you're within two hours of here now, you can reach a huge population, um, and especially with the train links, high-speed train links down to London, so the sky's the limit, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll definitely we'll ask that one later on uh, yeah. when, when we have the panel discussion. But in the meantime, Dr. David Jarrett. Thank you.
And now our final speaker before our intermission uh, is uh, the UK leader in her field, and, and that field is forensic anthropology. Her work has included as leader of the, Brit the British Forensic War Crimes Team in Kosovo and leading on identification of victims of the tsunami in Asia. Uh, her work's earned her an OBE, and in 2016 she was made a Dame. And she's also Pro Vice Chancellor for Engagement at Lancaster University. And now she's going to talk a little bit about the university's involvement in the Eden Project North and its scientific benefits. Please welcome Professor Dame Sue Black. Thank you very much indeed. There's a real incentive to going forth to get the slides to work. So thank you to all three who have gone before. Um, please don't be worried about mass fatalities and disasters. That's not why I'm involved in this project at all. It's an entirely different reason. I came to Lancaster 16 months ago, only 16 months ago. And the number of people who said to me, why on earth would you go to Lancaster? And the answer is, why not? And they don't have an answer to the why not. It's an incredible place, an utterly incredible place. And I can honestly say that in the 16 months that I've been here, I've felt very much at home. And one of the projects that's helped to make me feel at home is this, because it thinks big. I'm not the kind of woman who thinks small. <laughs> I like to think big. And you know, when I arrived at Lancaster, there is a very sobering thing that I do. Whenever I go to anywhere for the first time, and I call up my taxi driver test. And the taxi driver test is you get into a taxi, you ask the driver a question, and they assume if you've asked a question that you want to hear the answer. And you have the duration between when you get into the taxi and when you get out to the taxi. And if it's a long journey, do you know it can be a very long journey? And when I came for an interview at Lancaster, I asked the taxi driver, what's the relationship like between the university and Lancaster and Morecambe? And I expected them to say that it was a really strong town and gown. Do you know what they said to me? So I'm going to give you, these are his words. He said, university. Ah, it's not in Lancaster. It's outside Lancaster. Woo, that was a surprise up on a hill, and you can see all the images, can't you? It's not in Lancaster, it's up on a hill. I don't know what they do there, but you know, they must be awfully clever, and you know they've got a shed load of money, which is not true. But what that says, and it is part of the way in which Lancaster has grown up as a university, it was removed from the city, it was given a tract of land outside the city, it was isolated in its urban environment, in its rural environment, and it was allowed to get on with being a university. And it did it exceptionally well. And when I arrived, one of the things I said was, we need to have a much greater civic responsibility. Because if you're an anchor institution in a community and you close your doors, then everybody feels the ripples from that. And that tells you as an anchor institution, not only do you have a responsibility to run your own business well, but you also have a responsibility to make sure you run it well for the community in which you operate. So when I arrived, two members of our senior member of staff, long before I even had an inkling of Lancaster in my eye, went down to Eden. And these two gentlemen said to the project in Eden, have you ever thought about coming north to Lancashire? Have you ever thought about coming to Morecambe? And one of the first things that I've done in every, almost every presentation since I've been at Lancaster is to remind people that we're not the north. There's a shed load of north, north of Lancaster. And do you know what's really interesting? What's really interesting is when you look at the geography of our beautiful isles, the geographical center of the UK is Lancashire. The genuine epicenter of the UK 
this mortal. We are the middle and the heart of the UK. And in fact, it's a red heart because it's a red heart associated with our sovereignty as well. So in terms of our history, in terms of our currency, why would you not do this in Morecambe? It is the center of the UK. And to know where you're going, you have to know where you've come from. And it's why it's really important that we know about our history. But what we can't afford to do is to be tethered by our history. It can't be a millstone around our neck. It is who we are, but sometimes we need to move on from it. And moving on from it may look something like this. When the um, Eden Trustee Board came up to Morecambe, one of the gentlemen took a photograph of the sunset over the bay and he put it onto Twitter and he said, where in the world do you think I am? And back came the French Riviera, Rio de Janeiro, Goa. Nobody said Morecambe, <laughs> but they will. Trust me, they will. Because when this iconic image, and it will be an utterly iconic image, goes around the world, which it will do, Morecambe will never be the same again. And to move forward, we have to be prepared to change. So what's a university got to do with this? Because when we look at Eden and Cornwall, the involvement of universities are fairly marginal. From the outset, we said at Lancaster University, we want to be right at the heart of this because there's so much that we can do in relation to the cutting edge research that goes on within the institution on so many different fronts. Oh, it's an interesting one. That's not what my slide looked like at all. <laughs> Anyhow, so that what we are, and there was me boasting. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's good enough. However, so that in 2018, Lancaster University was the university of the year in the UK. In 2020, starting from January, we are the international university of the year. That's on the doorstep. We need to be proud of that. We need to be able to use that. And how can we use it? We use it in the areas in which the university has most strength. Part of that is in our research. We are leading in so many different ways in our research. We have world thinkers inside the university changing the way the entirety of the world thinks about so many important projects. We have incredible education. And to our absolute shame, prior to me coming here, we had next to no involvement with Lancaster and Morecambe College. We do now. We have a terrific relationship with Lancaster and Morecambe College now. And it's only going to go from strength to strength. And you're going to hear about the incredible work that Wes is doing alongside Eden just a little bit later. And the third thing, which is why I'm here, is in relation to engagement. How do we take something that is a world-class institution and use it? Use it to the benefit of the communities in which we operate. That's what's engagement about. People say, what does engagement mean? Ladies and gentlemen, there's a very good reason why you get engaged before you get married. Engagement is about relationships. Do I like this person? Do I not like this person? Is this a one night stand? Or is this going to be a long term relationship? And when it doesn't work, how do we end it? That's all engagement is about. And we're going through the most marvelous honeymoon period in relation to our relationship with Eden, in relation to all of our partners, including Lancaster and Morecambe College. We know there will be difficult times ahead, but any marriage that's worth its salt is worth fighting for. And if it was all easy, do you know, anybody would do it. So we expect there will be hard times. Oh, yes, it's interesting. Okay. So that in relation to... <laughs> bear with me. So that in relation to where we sit as a beacon in terms of our community partnership, it's about saying with an, in, an international university on the doorstep 
and other incredibly good universities and colleges and other institutions around us, can we work together, not in competition, but in collaboration? So much more is achieved if you work together than if you try to work in isolation for your own benefit. So that we know that working together in partnership, there are areas in particular, Morecambe is just incredible for it, where all of the kind of work that our university does, where we're recognized around the world, can all have a benefit in our local community. There's no point in having international aspirations if you don't actually practice what you preach in your own community. And that's what we need to be doing and doing much more of. So what sorts of things do we do? Well, the kinds of things that we do is a huge amount in relation to our global planetary crisis. Areas in terms of what's happening in our oceans, what's happening to the extremes of our weather, wildfires, wildlife, crops, agriculture. Huge amounts of research, multi-million pounds worth of research going on looking at what's happening in different places around the world. Imagine if we turn that focus a little bit closer to home and we can say, how can Morecambe play its part on that international stage? Not just Lancaster University, but Morecambe and the area around here. If we're not operating at an international level, then all of our partners can be as well. If it's not the global crisis, then maybe it's about clean energy. Is it that we have all of the natural resources that we need on this coast? And the answer is yes. So are we saying that in terms of sustainability, in terms of green energy, can Morecambe actually be leading the way in showing what a sustainable and green energy life looks like? Why not? What about our health? And we just heard from Andy about some of the really incredible statistics associated with health in certain parts of our community. Imagine if we all made it our responsibility to think about not just our own health, but the health of others. Could we change the way that other people think? Could Morecambe actually become the healthiest and the happiest place to live? Maybe in the UK, but I don't think small. Couldn't we be the happiest place in the world? Why not? Why not? You've got to have an aspiration. And if they think we're in the French Riviera, why can't we feel as if we're in the French Riviera? So I genuinely believe that the kind of research that we do in a community with the resilience and the foresight that this community has, I think there's nothing that we can't do. There's nothing that's beyond our ability. What do we want our future cities and our future towns to look like? Well, maybe we want them to look like Morecambe. Maybe it's not Morecambe today. Maybe it's Morecambe tomorrow. Or maybe it's Morecambe in a year's time. Why can't we be that beacon? Why can't we be the place where people say, that's where I want to go and live? Because do you know what they did? They found kindness. And I so support what Andy has said. There is not enough kindness in the world. If you look at what makes our headlines in the media, it's about things that are about fear, it's things that are about selfishness, it's things that are often about hurting other people. But you know, somebody's got to turn the tide on that. And what better place to turn a tide than in Morecambe? I have never felt so welcome in a community in such a short space of time. And that gives me great hope, enormous hope, that this is genuinely a magical place that can change people's thoughts and people's actions. The future could look like Morecambe. And wouldn't we be proud if that was the case? We have to think big. We, haven't, we mustn't be constrained by what we think we might be able to do. I hate boxes, throw them away. Don't think outside the box, get rid of the darn boxes. 
Let's think differently. Let's think smart. Let's think together. Think big, but we've got a dream even bigger. There has never been a better opportunity to do something like this. With the partners that we have, with the innovation that we have, with the sheer imagination that we have, if you can't do it here, you can't do it anywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to change Morecambe. I want Morecambe to change the world. You can do that. We can do that if we do it together. There are points in history that we remember, and often there are points that we remember for bad reasons. We remember, those of us who are old enough, when Elvis died, don't we? Yeah, we know what we were doing. People who remember where they were when the Princess of Wales lost her life. People who remember where they were when the planes went into the World Trade Center. Can we stop linking our lives to things that are bad? Can we remember where we were when Eden at Morecambe was an idea and the moment that Eden at Morecambe became a reality? That's something to remember. That's something to pass on to our children, something to pass on to our grandchildren, to be positive about it, to be proud of it, and to think as large as we can possibly go. And I think you've heard enough from me. Thank you. Wow. I, I could sit and talk to you for hours, Sue. Could, could <laughs> you tell that to my husband? I wish he'd talk to me we don't have. We don't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Yes, I will. Um, but we will, you are going to come and be on radio. We'll have, we'll have a chat. We'll have a chat then. Um, but one thing I wanted to, wanted to ask you, and I appreciate you, I don't know whether you can answer this question or not, but be, being from Morecambe, I'm, I'm quite interested in whether you could, you could envisage, the, with the partnership of Lancaster University and the Eden Project, when the Eden Project opened, Lancaster University having a base in Morecambe. Oh, we will. So that's going to happen anyway. That's going to happen in relation to the research that we're doing in one of those shells. So we will be there. Um, we want actually it to be bigger than just Lancaster University. So we're thinking about whether one of those shells actually needs to be taken over by the, the N8, so the eight big universities that we have in the north, making it a beacon for research, cutting edge research in the north that says it happens here. It's an observatory, three quarters of a million people will come through those doors every year. Those three quarters of a million people are just waiting for the kind of education that we're going to give them that they'll take out into the rest of the world. We want them to take Morecambe with them. So we want to impact on them. And to do that, we have to be there not just showing them research. People who, who see research don't do research. So we want them to be a part of the research. And so this living laboratory that, that we envisage will be very, very active, but not just with Lancaster University. This is a collaborative project. If it becomes something that we contain and it's ours and nobody else is allowed in, do you know we've failed? It has to be open and it has to be cooperative. So we want every university in there. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. <laughs> and just, just and every further education college. slowly working around them all. We're getting there. <laughs> Just found out everything I need to know about Myers Co. the other day. Fascinating. I'd like, However, to, say, okay. I'd like to say we're going to hear from Wes from Lancaster we Morecambe are. College in the second half as well. Um, but uh, during the intermission, we're, we're going to uh, be selling the calendars. And yes. uh, they're, they're two pounds and, and, and money from that going, going towards... A charity Escape chosen by Cy, which I know you're a patron of. Just, just, I, um, if you'd like to just tell the, the audience oh, a little any, bit about Any of you who make. don't know Jenny, Jenny Natouche, run now. So she came to the university and she said, um, we're, we're looking to raise some funds. And I said, well, don't come to me for money because what I'd rather you did is you came to me for a partnership and let's work together to find the money to make this happen. And it's the most incredible charity. It's aimed towards teenagers who feel lonely and lost and isolated, 
who have seen creativity taken out of their schools. And all they want to do is to get together in an environment where they're not judged, where they feel really safe to explore themselves, to be creative, to have fun, and to have a community. And so when I said to Jenny, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give you money. Let's work together to find the money. What, what do you want me to do? She said, be the patron. So I was in a corner by that point. I couldn't get away. That's what I mean. Be careful about her. She's sneaky. Is that, and, and we just a few weeks ago, we had the most marvelous evening, all put on by the youngsters at the Dukes in Lancaster. And they showed us the videos that they'd made. They talked about how important it is to them. We forget really at our peril that our future relies on young people. And we need these young people to be as healthy in their own minds and their own bodies as they possibly can be. Because they're the ones that are going to take this planet forward and take forward all of the mess that some of us have made in our lifetime. We need to be able to give them the support. So it's a small charity at this stage. But Jenny doesn't think small either. So we want to start it in Lancaster, and we want then it to spread literally to every single city and every single town that you can be so that we don't have teenagers who feel lonely or who feel scared or who feel that they have pressures that are putting not only physical but mental strain on them as well. It's a brilliant charity. It has next to no money. We are really doing everything we possibly can. So don't buy one, one um, calendar, please. I'm sure you've got so many family members who would love to have a Morecambe calendar. Ten each would just be fantastic. That would be good. And, and Jenny's here. Jenny, give us a wave. Where are you, Where's Jenny? Jenny? She's here somewhere. There Where she is. is. <laughs> oh, she's there. Give Jenny a round of applause. Yay! And also a massive round of applause. We'll hear from her again later on. Uh, the fascinating Sue. Professor Dave Sue, Sue Black. Sue. 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 <laughs> okay, everybody, so you've heard from four of our experts, and in the second half we'll hear from Professor Vanessa Toolman from the Winter Gardens Preservation Trust and also Wes Johnson, the principal of Lancaster Morecambe College. Then the floor's open to you, so get thinking now. You've heard a lot. You've probably taken a lot in. It's got the, the, the cogs whirring. Have a think about some questions. We may not be able to get around everybody during the evening, but we'll try and answer as many as we can, and we'll do that in the second half. So now we're going to have an intermission, and we'll be back with an evening, uh, an evening with Eden very, very soon. Thank you. So uh, we're going to move on with the second part of uh, an evening with Eden. And just, just to recap, we've got two more speakers, and then we're going to have uh, our Q&A where you will all get, uh, well, um, as many questions as we can in the, in, in the limited time that we will have, we'll give you the opportunity to ask to our panel. So now we're going to hear from a speaker who uh, was born and uh, grew up in Morecambe. Uh, her family, in fact, uh, ran the old fairground at the Winter Gardens. Uh, her parents ran a guest house in Morecambe. Uh, and her interest in the, in the, in the fairground field uh, led her to set up the National Fairground Archive at the uh, University of Sheffield, where she's also the Director of City and Culture. And returning to her family roots, uh, she recently became the chair of the Winter Gardens Preservation Trust. So talking about the historical role of the Winter Gardens and its involvement with Eden, please welcome Professor Vanessa Toolman. side. Um, I recognize this. This is the lovely uh, seagull that's on the uh, webcam. And I look at it every night from Sheffield, where I live now, and I see the wonderful seagull. I don't often see the view. I see the seagull sat in front of the webcam. Um, I wanted to start with this picture, because when I first came back about a year ago, uh, to the Winter Gardens. I, I came back because I was part of the trustee board. I was a new trustee. And then sadly, the previous chair of the Winter Gardens, as we all know, Evelyn Archer, sadly died. And then we found ourselves in a position of having to take over the Winter Gardens and kind of look at what it could be. And I saw this photograph or this image from Eden, uh, which was very exciting, but I actually wasn't looking at the shells and the wonderful design. I was looking at that red building in the middle literally across the road. 
And I realized, wow, I'm going to have some amazing neighbors. Uh, and because that building that you see across the road is the Winter Gardens. Um, and what I want to talk to you about tonight is Eden is not going to be the great white hope of Morecambe. Morecambe has to help itself. And people who run buildings and are part of Morecambe have to be ready for Eden so that we are a suitable and fitting and amazing companion to be part of that story. So my job for the next five years, if I'm still allowed to be, is to make the Winter Gardens ready for Eden and for Morecambe and also for the United Kingdom. Because it is a building of international and national significance. So, so there we are. That's the Winter Gardens as we see it today. I just want to ask... How many people in this room have been into the Winter Gardens? Okay. How many of you have been in the last year? And have you noticed the difference? So I want to talk to you about that difference and why it's so important that we get this building ready and what this building could be and what the vision for the building could be. So health and well-being abounds. Walks in Winter Gardens was the original place where you went for health and well-being. The original Winter Gardens in 1876, where you could have a tepid bath of Morecambe Sea Water. Um, and we still actually have one of those original baths still in the, in the building itself. As we all know, uh, in an act of vandalism, which still people think about where were you when something bad happened, I remember where I was in 1982 when the original Winter Gardens was torn down. And I'm sure many people in this room do as well. So this is the opening program for the Winter Gardens and the Pavilion. But this is it. So what we have left today is the actual Victoria Pavilion, the theatre. And we talk about cycles, David's lovely cycle of tourism. You can see that in the Winter Gardens. Every 30 years, a new owner. And it wasn't really a successful theatre. And I'm talking as a professor of entertainment history now. The Winter Gardens Morecambe was not a successful theatre in many aspects of the word. It wasn't a world-class theatre in what it attracted, but it was the potential to be. And in the first 10 years, it was a world-class venue. And this is the different owners that you have, and it's important to see, because what happened then, it was demolished. And thanks to the amazing Friends of the Winter Gardens, of which there are many in here today, the building was saved. And then it took another 20 years before they got to own the building. And then... Now, in the last 20 years, or in the last 10 years, what is this building? And people say to me, well, what's so special about the Winter Gardens? Well, it's a grade two star listed building. And to people, that is only 6% of the buildings in the United Kingdom. Only 6% of the buildings are grade two star. It's on the National Buildings at Risk Register, which doesn't mean that it's actually going to fall down. It means it's of such historical significance that it has to be protected at all costs. It's formerly capacity of 2,500, which makes it one of the largest venues in the Northwest. The only larger venue in terms of a theatre is the Opera House in the Winter Gardens Blackpool. So that's the capacity we have in terms of a 19th century theatre. The only theatre outside in the Northwest that is larger is the Opera House in Blackpool. It opened in 1897, it closed in 1997. It's had years of risk, salvation, and currently owned and operated by the Winter Gardens Preservation Trust, which I'm highly honoured. I never thought as a child on the Winter Gardens fairground, when I used to jib in, like many people did, and go up in the gods and watch things for nothing, I never thought that I would then be responsible for this building. Um, and, what, and what I want to show you is what this building looks like today. It is quite magnificent. It does need money spending on it and lots of money, but what it really needs, love, respect, attention, and also help. We need help from the local people. We need volunteers, but we really need people who want to come in. We are open for business. These are just two aspects. That's wonderful ceiling. Winter Gardens was actually designed almost to be a railway station. The structural beams of the railway station are similar to St. Pancras in London. What they did is they covered it in this amazing plaster. So it's the largest expanse of fibrous plaster in the country when it opened, the same designers of the Winter Gardens Blackpool, and the stained glass. So what we've been trying in the last nine months 
is what these three R's, renovation, restoration, and relationships. And the trust has raised over a quarter of a million pounds since March this year. I think that's quite an amazing achievement, which is more than the trust has raised in 10 years. And what we don't want to do is basically go for like the 12 million, which is what happened last time. And the building really wasn't ready for that. It's a gradual restoration, a gradual renovation, where we open up more and more of the building and build up what we want to have in the building. To repair, to restore the plaster work, to enable capacity. And currently we're at 700, but in reality it should be 2,500. In fact, it could be up to 3,000 if we get all the kind of structures in place. And then we want to see the governance and best practice. So the money we have is for very practical things. Essentially, you'll be all pleased to know that there will be a heating system put in next year. You'll be all pleased to know that beautiful plaster ceiling will be protected, soundproofed, and also put a system in place that we can have different kind of music in there. But what I want to think about it is the vision and potential. The Winter Gardens Morecambe, the Victoria Pavilion, was built as a concert hall and not just a variety theatre. In its long and illustrious history, Elgar had five concerts in the Winter Gardens Morecambe. Five premieres from 1903 to 1908. So the Winter Gardens was known as the Albert Hall of the North. It was a place for middle class respectability. This is when Morecambe was a place, as my grandmother used to say to me, Morecambe was where a middle class man bought his mistress and Blackpool was where a working class man took his slapper. <laughs> I hope the Eden project attracts a slightly better class of tourists. That's not to say anything about Blackpool. I have spent seven years working there. And my role was actually to bring more middle class people to bring their mistresses to Blackpool. And it worked. <laughs> So it was built as a concert hall and a music venue. The acoustics in the Winter Gardens, no offence to this lovely building, are far superior. You actually don't uh, need a microphone most of the time. It was a home for variety and theatre, but it was also home for the, National, for the Morecambe Music Festival. And the Morecambe Music Festival was so famous that when Elgar was asked in 1903, where is the future of classical music, he said somewhere further north, and he meant Morecambe. This place, this whole area was famous for its singers, for its choral music, for its working class tradition of choirs. And I think it's wonderful that we're bringing choirs and music back to the Winter Gardens. It was a home to Vaughan Williams and to Elgar. And it was a home to the Halley Orchestra all the way through the 1940s. So the Halley Orchestra, which is Lancashire's orchestra, only now ever plays in Blackburn or in the Bridgewater Hall. It plays more in Sheffield than it does in Lancashire. And we want to bring the Halley Orchestra back. Well, our vision is in 2021 to open the Winter Gardens with a season, a weekend of Elgar played by the Halley Orchestra. So have that vision of what we think the building should be. It's the potential to be the largest indoor arena. No offence, I, si, I'll show you 4,000 outdoor stadium in Morecambe's inclement weather, and I'll have 2,500 people and in the Winter Gardens for when it rains. We're always open. That's what we mean by partnership. We always want people in the building. We have no desire of the trust to run the building. We want the building to be for the locals, for the community, for businessmen, for businesswomen, and for partnerships. We want the building to be what it originally was, the hub and centre of Morecambe and the people who came to Morecambe. We're looking at the idea of a conference centre and a learning space to build in the audience space for Eden and future developments in the town. This is our foyer today, this beautiful foyer. And underneath that foyer is one of the most incredible Italian mosaics uh, that was constructed, Terrazza Floor, um, which needs about £150,000 of restoration. So what we're doing is each part of the building we're looking at how we can fund, how we can work with volunteers. We have the most amazing group of volunteers. I call them the bike shed boys and girls because they come on a Tuesday and a Wednesday. They're former French polishers from Waring and Giller. They're builders, they're engineers, they're structural. They're people who can use their hands. And they come in every Tuesday and every Wednesday and lovingly they've restored this building. 
And these are just some of the work that we've done. You can see here. See here, this is these wonderful alabaster angels. These are throughout the building, and these are the features that make the Winter Garden so special. The tiles at the end are by Bermontoff. They were made for aspirational middle class pubs, railways, and theatres. Morecambe Winter Gardens, the whole, every tile inside the building is done by Bermontoff, who also did Howard's Food Hall and also did Blackpool Winter Gardens. So the aspiration for Morecambe Winter Gardens was also, also being of a national standard. These are areas that you don't see. So when you walk in, you see the muses, the muses of song and dance and music and poetry. Gives you an idea. Those are the boxes. But these are the park. Now, one of the interesting things about the Winter Gardens when I first came back, I thought, I don't really understand this building because it's not just a theatre. One third of the building is not used. One third of the building was for promenading, for smoking, for those kind of wonderful moments where you could have an indoor pier and you could walk along the whole length of the Winter Gardens and the, and the Victoria Pavilion uh, and walk along inside a building and these spaces. But why not think of it as a conference and learning centre? Why not think of it as a place where people could come to Morecambe, um, not just party political broadcasts or, or conferences, but national conferences to go alongside what's going on in Eden? Let's build it up. Uh, this is a CAD that one of our volunteers done, a conference hall for Morecambe. So we can increase the capacity. You know that we're doing the chair campaign, where our volunteers and through the help and sponsorship of people in Morecambe, we've raised over £15,000 to restore the chairs back into the original Winter Gardens. But we still need more. But there we are. So this is when George Formby appeared at the Winter Gardens uh, in 1947, and that's our wonderful, wonderful roof, which has caused us lots of problems, but we've now got £150,000. And once that's done, and the heating... We hope within the next 12 months the capacity will be 1,500. And we will build that audience. I'm not expecting an audience overnight of 2,500 to come to the Winter Gardens. But I hope within the next two to three years we'll increase the capacity from 700 to 1,000 to 1,500 and bring national and international promoters to Morecambe to see the view and to also. But this is the space. How many of you have actually been onto the second and third floor of the Winter Gardens? How many of you have been on one of my tours? Yes, very good. Um, all that area there, and it's unparalleled with the views of Morecambe. Think about what we could use that for. Think about how it could be, could be one of the most beautiful art galleries in the city, and the town. But what could we use this for? And this is the top floor. It could be the most incredible restaurant or creative space. But one of the things we have to do is learn how to work with the building. And we want local businesses to come and talk to us. We want you to be part of that story. We are not a closed building or a closed organisation. We are open for business and we are open for new ideas and new blood. Uh, as much as I love my Tuesday and Wednesday volunteers, I, I do want to bring the average age down by down to 70. So, <laughs> no offence, Malcolm, 50. <laughs> um, so it's partnerships, the new imagining of the resort through mutual branding and storyboarding. I've had wonderful conversations with Sai. Do you know that Morecambe had its own blue? Morecambe blue. The Winter Gardens throughout it is covered in this beautiful shade of blue. It was called Morecambe Blue. It was not just the Naples of the North. It had its own colour, its own branding. We want a diverse visitor attractions, attracting a different, higher spending market. It is about economics as well. It is about the secondary spend and how much people spend. And we want there to be other venues and other attractions in Morecambe for people to come to. We want to see types of events that show off the building and don't destroy the building. We want types of events that respect the building, but we don't want to pick all the building in aspect. Uh, I did seven years of seaside shows in Blackpool. I want a different type of show for Morecambe. We're looking at community engagement and willing to be part of any further dialogue. And we need, need trustees, additional volunteers and input. Our door is always open. So the Winter Gardens itself, I look at this and I see it's the end of a perfect day at Morecambe. The Winter Gardens was the original part of Morecambe's regeneration, and it was 13 amazing businessmen and women from Bradford who built the Winter Gardens, believe it or not. 13 investors from Bradford. But today, we need investors 
from our town, from our resort, from our region. And we need to know that I was brought up saying, what Lancashire does today, the world does tomorrow. We need that to be about the story of Morecambe through the Winter Gardens. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, but one thing I, I, I found really interesting about what you were talking about there was the um, little good-natured thing you had with Cy there about talking about his 4,000 capacity venue across the road and your aspirations for uh, a venue of up to, I think you said, 3,000? Well, 2,500 two is seated. And if we get the fire flow, and one of the things that we're doing at the moment is working with the council on the High Street Fund, because you know Morecambe is the area. So the Winter Gardens is part of that, which is absolutely fantastic. I have to say Lancaster Council have been amazing. They've really been fantastic in terms of their willingness to engage with the building. And we're putting in, uh, as part of the High Street Fund, half a million for the infrastructure of the Winter Gardens, which is not just more heating, but more toilets. One of the most essential things about indoor venues is the number of toilets you need per person. Very sad. Sorry, that's not the kind of person I am. But those kind of <laughs> logistics are very important when you run events. But how would you, how would you see two venues of, of that size well, you just, coexisting in Morecambe and, and sustaining? I think it's, well, I think you've got to look at, you just bake a bigger cake, don't you? Everyone has to have a slice, but you just bake a bigger cake, and that's the whole idea. Um, Blackpool has 25,000 theatre seats to sell a night. So why should we worry about having a 2,000 or 4,000 next to each other? It means that we can have a bigger festival. <laughs> but, it, uh, but it also means, you know, not just time for business side, we're your wet weather solution. <laughs> this is true. And uh, just one last thing, because I know everybody was very excited when you talked about the heating. Anybody who's been in the Winter Gardens knows about that. Um, you said within 12 months, is there an actual start time that you've got uh, nailed we've, down? We've, obviously, we've got a heating grant through the Coastal Community Fund, and that starts with basically putting the heating in uh, in the next four months. We're starting the process. So it's going to be a year. Don't forget, it is a grade two-star listed building, and I have to say part of the work we've had to do is there's like 10 years of non-consent done. So a lot of, we've had to do a lot of retrospective work on the building just to get it back to that standard. So the, the most crucial thing, actually, is not the heating. So you're a bit nesher here. I live in Sheffield now. Please, please tell you, I have to say, it's minus 12 in the winter in Sheffield, so I can take the cold. Um, it is more about the plaster work because the sound vibrations of modern, modern sound systems actually cause problems with the plaster. Um, so that is essential, the money from Historic England. That will then open up the top of the building and enable us to use the second floor and the first floor, and that will give us a capacity of up to 2,500. That, that is the essential piece of work. Um, and then what I think we should do, but obviously it's all open to consultation, is keep the ground floor as it is, not seated, so that you can have different types of music venues and different types of events in there, um, and then create a larger audience for the top. But, you know, it's all open to things. We've got to be flexible, really. Uh, there's a few things that won't go back into the Winter Gardens, I think, because we've just got to respect what the building is. Okay. Well, I think Craig Charles is ringing. He wants a word with you, so we better, we better wrap that one up. <laughs> I'll be making him a cup of tea tomorrow, don't worry. Absolutely. Um, but, yeah, thank you very much. Another fascinating speaker there, Professor Vanessa Tillman. Oh, thank you. Okay, and finally, in terms of our, our, our expert speakers this evening, now that, as, we, as we know, the work of the Eden Project in Morecambe has already begun, and one of the most significant investments, partnerships already made in, in, in terms of looking ahead to the town's future is Eden's 25-year agreement with Lancaster and Morecambe College. And here to speak about that and also the educational benefits of the planned Eden Project is the Principal and Chief Executive of Lancaster and Morecambe College, Wes Johnson. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, have you ever heard that phrase, what an act to follow? <laughs> Try five of them. Okay, it's been a fantastic evening, some great information. Um, there are a set of slides behind me. Um, I'm assuming they're the set that I prepared. Uh, there may not be, so if there's anything controversial on there, that bit wasn't mine, okay. 
Um, it's a real honour and a privilege to stand in front of you as the principal of your college, okay? And that's the important thing to start this presentation. That's the first thing on the slide. Lancaster and Morecambe College is your college. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to the governors. It's your college dedicated to the young people and adults of Lancaster and Morecambe District, okay? That's our driving force. My journey, my college's, our college's journey, began with Eden just over a year ago. Uh, news of Eden broke. Uh, I immediately picked up the phone, spoke to Cy Bellamy, and said, Cy, you're going to need a workforce. Okay. Got in a car, drove for 10 hours, and Cy and I met just over a year ago. Okay. Eden, if you've been to the consultation, is likely to employ around 390 people. Okay. There may well be 5,000 people in the Eden supply chain. My job is to make sure that there are some fantastic opportunities for the young people and adults of Lancaster and Morecambe. Okay, that's what we do. So what I'm also going to do during my presentation is reality check some of the things that you've heard tonight and that you may have heard throughout this Eden journey. Okay, is it really that good? Is it too good to be true? Well, I'll cut straight to the punchline. It really is that good. Okay, and it could well be even better than we can ever imagine. Just one plea from me before we move on any further. During the next 15 minutes, just keep an eye on the person that you sat next to. And without compromising yourselves, if they do fall asleep, just give them a little nudge. Okay. <laughs> Let's just keep it going. Okay. So why does Eden connect with Lancaster and Morecambe College? Why have we signed a 25-year agreement? So you'll probably pass the college on a daily basis. Okay, particularly now the Bay Gateway goes straight through the college grounds, which I have to say is probably one of the best things that's ever happened to the college. This is the purpose of your college. This is why we exist. It's twofold. The first part is being a community-based college which is completely shaped by our employers. Okay, everything that we do at college is shaped by the employers. That's why I'm a director of the Chamber of Commerce. That's why my senior team sit not only on Lancaster bid, but on more can bid as well, to make sure that that employer voice is strong. We want our graduated students to be assets to your businesses, okay? To do that, who better to shape it than the employers in our wonderful area? But the second purpose of Lancaster and Morecambe College is equally important, okay? Lancaster and Morecambe College is here and it's accessible to every member of our community. Lancaster and Morecambe College did never aspires to be an elite, exclusive organisation. We want to be high performing and completely inclusive. We play a significant role in our community in terms of holding things together. Okay. And there's lots more we need to do on that. You know, why is it that 69% of the 1,000 16 to 18 year olds I've got in our college haven't got the English and maths qualifications they should have got? Why is it that nearly half of the population of our college come from the bottom 20% in terms of the multiple indices of deprivation? Why is it that we have to have a food bank in the college for our adult students? Okay, there's lots we can do together, and that's a duty for all of us. Okay, because what there is in Lancaster and Morecambe is fantastic opportunity, okay, right now. So during the presentations you've heard tonight, you've heard a lot about the past. You've heard a lot about a really exciting future, which I'm sure we're all reaching out to grab. What I'm going to talk about is what's happening right now, okay? Wonderful opportunities for young people and adults and a future we should all be really proud of, okay? We should all be really excited about, even at nearly 10 o'clock on a Saturday evening, okay? So that's why the college is here. You may have wondered, okay? You may have wondered, but that's why we're here as your college. Okay, so what have we done with Eden Project Learning? We've signed a 25-year agreement. Crikey, that sounds like a long time, doesn't it? Okay. The whole point in terms of what we're doing around education is it has to be at least generational. It can't be a fantastic one-year project. It can't be a great five-year project. It's got to be something that really makes a difference. Shortly after I met Cy down at Eden, uh, I met a colleague that I now work with on a weekly basis, Professor Robert Barrett, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, but he'll be back in Morecambe on Tuesday. Robert heads up Eden Project Learning, okay, which is under the Eden umbrella, and it's a partnership in Cornwall between Eden Project and Cornwall College. Um, so Robert and I have worked absolutely hand in hand over the last year, alongside colleagues such as Sue uh, from the university and a whole range of stakeholders I'll explain in more detail later. You may well have seen that the sign outside the college has changed. OK, 
Okay, it changed on a Thursday sometime during in August. And the reason I know was being re responsible for health and safety both in and outside the college. I went to look at this wonderful sign that you can see there. And I also then turned to the road and looked at the drivers that were passing by. I thought, crikey, there's quite a liability here because everybody's rubbernecking at the new sign. Everybody's seeing Eden on the ground already in Morecambe. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's a level of interest that this has already generated. So it's a generational agreement. Okay, it's a long-term thing. Okay, this is going to happen. This is happening right now, okay, in our district. And my first reality check is, Sue said that Lancaster University has a much better relationship with Lancaster and Morecambe College than it's ever had. That's true, absolutely true. We've got fantastic partnerships at all levels. Myself and Sue, we're looking forward to a great relationship with the new incoming vice chancellor. My first meeting on Monday is with our business development team at college, with the business development team from the university, to look at how jointly we can support local businesses, local employers, from employing an apprentice right through to postgraduate study and everything in between. So yeah, Lancaster and Morecambe College is absolutely working hand in hand with Lancaster University to the benefit of our community. So going back to my conversation with Cy, for Cy to have a workforce, I've got to start my production line now, okay? Because no young people will go through my production line for at least two years, okay? And if our hope for Eden is as planned that it opens in 2023, that production line's got to get going. But because of the courage of our convictions, because we were absolutely convinced and checked everything that Eden told us, that we've got confidence that this is going to happen. So over the last few months, we've completely rebalanced our land-based curriculum at the college. Okay, everything now is skewed to what we're calling an Eden study program. Okay, it's the knowledge, the skills, the behaviors that young people will need to thrive as a potential Eden employee of the future, but also as employees in a whole range of new green industries that are already emerging. Okay, they're already here, and Eden will be the catalyst for those to proliferate over the next decade. Okay, so did that generate any interest? Well, actually, we've got about 47 students already enrolled on our Eden study program. Okay, young people that are really committed to working. Uh, in a land-based scenario, working in our community, and the first real tangible example of something special in terms of place-based education. And I'll come back to that term. We've heard tonight from so many of the speakers how special our local environment is. It really is, and actually it's a great classroom. It's a great tool for education that we're pushing forward with. Eden is here, Eden is on the ground. Okay, we have established an Eden Project Learning Hub at the college. It's on the sixth floor of our biggest building. Um, I'm led to believe that that building is described most favorably as brutalist 1960 architecture. Okay, I'm sure you've got your own thoughts of that building as you drive past, and I certainly have when I look up at it on a daily basis. Okay, but actually on the top floor of that building is a brand new Eden Project Hub that overlooks all of the reasons that I gave you earlier to answer the question, why Morecambe? Okay, and my colleague, Professor Robert Barrett, often takes to stakeholders to that room, looks out of the window and says, that's why. It's the outstanding landscape. It's the community, it's the employment, it's the special features, it's the history, it's the culture, it's the passion, it's the, that opportunity to change lives. That's why Morecambe. And from our Eden Project Learning Hub, at Lancaster and Morecambe College, the picture window explained, okay, and nobody's ever questioned it. People get it. But more importantly, this creates fantastic opportunities for all of us, okay, really exciting opportunities. And as a college, we go a long way to engage a lot of young people that haven't previously been interested in education. So out of those 1,000 students that I talked about that are 16 to 18, that's excluding our apprentices and our adults, about 140 of them didn't really get on with the school system. Okay, so we have to re-engage them, we have to give them a taste of what it's like to be a, a plumber, what it's like to be a hairdresser, what it's like to be a childcare assistant. Eden supercharges that. Okay, Eden supercharges our ability to engage with those mo most vulnerable 
young people in our community, to give them hope, to give them aspiration, and to make them feel valued. Okay, and that's really important. Eden's a catalyst for good, a catalyst for happiness, and a catalyst for love that you've heard described before, and that's really keen, and that comes through every time we speak to Professor Barrett as well. Okay. So, yeah, first reality check. Eden is on the ground. Eden is committed to Lancaster and Morecambe. And, wow, what a fantastic relationship we've now got with Lancaster University. But it's bigger than that. Okay, it's bigger than that. So Sue mentioned the sunsets, okay? There's a couple of snapshots that I got from the sunset the other day. That's from our Eden Project Learning Hub on the top, top right and top left. Uh, there's an internal shot there. You don't see many classrooms in Lancaster and Morecambe with deck chairs in, okay? What we wanted to do is replicate a fantastic building they've got in Cornwall um, called the Green, the Green Build Hub, okay, which is where Eden Project Learning is based. And again, I've been down there and experienced it firsthand. A nice space for learning, our bookings from primary schools are going through the roof to come and look, use that space as a flexible space um, to really just get a different view on learning, to get engaged and to look out of that window and really understand place. You may also recognize some of the boards on the bottom left there. Okay, they're some of the boards that Eden Project International used during the consultation exercise. They're now permanently displayed, or certainly for the next few years until Eden comes out of the ground, in our HEX building, which is right at the heart of the college. So on the first Tuesday evening of every month, Professor Robert Barrett sits in the HEX, and if any of you want to come in and really understand you know, the numbers, uh, and numbers were mentioned earlier by Greg, um, they're all on the boards behind us. Okay? And there's an opportunity there for you to talk to a member of the Eden team on the ground in Morecambe, who spends a week, a month here in Morecambe, to really understand it, but also to submit your ideas. The red circle in the middle says, what else would you like to see? Okay, and unfortunately, post-it notes don't stick to it very well, which is why most of them are on the floor, okay? <laughs> but actually, the most intriguing one was uh, attractive mermen, I think. So I don't, don't know, Si, if that's on your list, but uh, okay. So yeah, a special space, Eden on the ground. Eden is real in Lancaster and Morecambe District. But it's much bigger, okay, it's much bigger. Okay, the Morecambe Bay curriculum. Okay, the reasons for the Morecambe Bay curriculum are in the box there. Okay, this is something that we really need to do, we really should do, but it doesn't necessarily fit with traditional models of education. So we're going to have to do something different. Okay, we're going to have to create a different way. So, the original plan, let's create a Morecambe Bay curriculum from ages 3 to 25. Okay? Embracing our university partners, embracing all those stakeholders. That was going great until we met the early years providers at college. So these were the childminders, the nurseries, the, the primary schools. We said, actually, three's too late. You need to be prenatal. Okay, so you'll see in there, prenatal to 25, place-based curriculum is now our new mantra. Okay, and the point was from those early years providers, actually, what we're doing through Eden Project Learning can do good before birth, okay, in terms of supporting uh, mothers, families, uh, very, very young children to really engage, to feel valued, okay. So it's now prenatal, and that will emerge, okay. What we want to do is this idea of what are the skills, the attributes, the values, those golden Eden threads that a future Morecambe-based citizen should recognize and value, okay. Those golden threads of of sustainability, of place, of citizenship, and a whole list of other ones. So this idea of a future Morecambe-based citizen. Okay, so how could a young person demonstrate that they value, that they have the same values, that they want to make that positive contribution to the community, they want to be that, that positive future Morecambe-based citizen? Well, the idea emerging is they carry an Eden passport. Okay, and that Eden passport transcends early years, primary, secondary, FE, and university. Okay, and as it says in the suggestion, they carry with it and get that passport stamped as they demonstrate those skills, as they demonstrate those values. Okay. You'll see at the bottom there a whole range of stakeholders that are absolutely bought into this as well. Okay. Now, as a college, we host lots of meetings. The biggest challenge we've had with the Eden Project Learning meetings is getting people out of the college afterwards. Okay, so when we brought the primary school head teachers in, we couldn't get them to leave. They wanted to sit down there and write then and write the Morecambe Bay curriculum. Okay. When we have employers in, 
They want to have their name on the Eden supply chain. Okay, and if any of you attended the Expo, Expo event that the Chamber organized in September, you'll know that there was a signing in sheet. Lots and lots of businesses want to be part of Eden. The early years providers, we said that there'd only be four places on the steering group. We couldn't get them out of the room unless we expanded that so everybody could get their name on the steering group. Okay, and that's the sort of passion that's coming from education, and this is unique. In every college I've worked in, I've never experienced anything where the whole education sector is pulling together. They're pulling together behind Eden, they're pulling together behind this place-based education, something special, equipping our young people to be those Morecambe-based citizens of the future. Okay. So along that bottom line, you'll see the full range, the full spectrum, and it continues to expand. Okay, it continues to expand. Sue mentioned our colleagues down at Myersco, specialist land-based college. Of course, they've got something to contribute. But actually, knowledge of the Morecambe Bay curriculum has now gone right round the bay to my colleagues at Finesse College. Okay, out in Barrow. They want to be part of it. So on Friday, Robert and I are traveling up to Finesse to talk to uh, my colleague Andrew, who's the principal up there, uh, and a whole range of school leaders in finesse. Okay, they want to be part of this idea of the Morecambe Bay curriculum. So something special is happening. It's based with a rich heritage. It's based on huge opportunity for the future, but it's happening right now. Okay, so the reality check is, yeah, this is real. Okay, yeah, when we talk about full wages for people, I've been to the Watering Lane Nursery near St. Hostel, where adults with quite complex learning difficulties and disabilities are paid full salaries to grow the fruit and veg that supply the kitchens in Eden. Okay, it's real, it's happening. I've seen the deprived areas in St. Hostel where Eden's making a positive difference. Social prescribing, okay. But probably the most surreal thing that ever happened to me at Eden, and this was in my visit in June, was I sat down for a meeting with colleagues from Eden Project International by chance, there were colleagues from Lancaster City Council down there. We were having a really in-depth discussion. And then in the background, Sheik started their sound check. Okay? Sheik, you know, I'm not going to go into it. I was thinking of doing cabaret, you know, to sort of round off the event. But actually, Niles Oren and Sheik were the Eden sessions. Okay? And the most surreal experience was meeting colleagues that I knew very well from Lancaster and hearing this internationally acclaimed band doing a sound check in the background. But that's what Eden does. It brings together people. It is real, and I'm absolutely committed to it, and we've absolutely put the full might of Lancaster and Morecambe College absolutely behind Eden Project and Eden Project North. Okay, we believe in it. We are your college, and we're already delivering something special. Thank you very much. more great information there from Wes and I uh, was really interested to hear you talk about the, the courses and the, the, num the take up you've had already. Uh, when do the, the first courses start? They started in September, yeah, All so the, 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 our students are in place already, yeah, and we're looking at really exciting things like um, work placement opportunities in Eden in Cornwall. Uh, and again, you know, in terms of, of what we're doing here, it's already attracting national significance. And, and one thing that we're talking about with Professor Barrett and colleagues, uh, such as Sue from the university, is potentially a model that's internationally portable. You know, if we can do this in Morecambe, why can't we do it in China? Okay. Uh, so again, a huge range of opportunities from our young people uh, to see the world, to raise aspiration, to really see some great opportunities. And there might be people here to, tonight who are interested in those courses, either, either for the, you know, children, the grandchildren themselves. You know, I mean, I mean what, what kind of specific things, uh, if, if you've enrolled on a course, what kind of specific things are part of the curriculum? Yeah, so it's, it's very much a land-related qualification. But again, we're working with organisations such as Morecambe Bay Partnership to make sure that our students, as part of the Eden uh, study programme, contribute locally as well through volunteering opportunities, whether that be beach cleans or whether that be work placements with local organisations. So it is, it is very, very unique. There is no other qualification like this in, in the country, and it will continue to evolve. But I think, as, as Sue mentioned earlier, this isn't just about what we can do as a college. This is then creating those opportunities with other colleges, with the schools, with universities, creating those really clear progression routes. Uh, you know, and obviously, Eden Project Learning already has, has a really exciting um, course portfolio in Cornwall. And again, we hope some of that's transportable uh, to Lancaster and Morecambe. Okay. Well, Wes Johnson, thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, so, so while uh, Tom and John uh, take on their double life as removal men, um, just to say that if you want to hear a little bit more from Wes, just a bit of a cheap plug here, Wes and Professor Robert Barrett, who you heard him referring to, will be on my show on Beyond Radio at 6 p.m. on Tuesday night on 103.5 FM across Lancaster and Morecambe. So please tune in. Uh, so yeah, uh, very, very shortly, we're going to invite all our panel back up onto stage, and you're going to get the opportunity to ask some questions, uh, anything really you, you want to know about the plans for the Eden Project North. You, you may have come into the, uh, to tonight's evening with Eden not knowing very much, or maybe knowing quite, quite a bit, or maybe not realising that it's not just a, a tourism attraction that we're talking about. I mean, it's just the, the knock-on effects in terms of, of health and, and education and other parts of the local area and even further, uh, I'm sure has uh, been, been quite eye-opening to, to some people. So if there's anything you want to ask about, then this is your opportunity. Uh, we do have a few questions which have come in in advance as well, which uh, I'm going to try and get a couple of those in, but we'll try and give you as many opportunities as we can. So I think John and Tom are going to be roving around with microphones very, very shortly. But in the meantime, if I could invite our panel back up onto the stage, and I'll come and join you. <laughs> so we have Cy, Cy Bellamy. <laughs> Dr. Andy Knox. Okay. Sue Black. Professor Vanessa and Wes and David Jarrett. Okay, so, right, where should we start? Can we get the house lights up so I can see these lovely people? <laughs> My sight is terrible. Okay, so basically, if you want to ask a question, if you get your hands... Oh, give me two minutes. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, then. I'll ask one of the... If we need two minutes to get the camera set up, I'll ask... Um, well, Sai, first of all, we asked, I asked David earlier about numbers, about yeah. uh, respectively how many extra people the Eden Project North could bring to our area and the amount of money it could potentially generate for the economy. Yeah, it's a brilliant question because we've kind of gone over this in quite a lot of detail, as you'd expect. So for everybody's understanding, we're, we're looking at 760,000 people as a means of coming to Morecambe to come to Eden Project North per year. And that sounds like a lot of people. But in fact, in terms of its peak, that could be up to 4,000 people per day. Now, when you look at Cornwall, we can take up to 12,000 people per day. We're being really cautious about those visitor numbers and also making sure it's not the same as those people who've been to Eden Project in Cornwall, whereby most people pitch up at 11 and disappear at 4. We're going to have time ticketing, which means that we can progress those visitors throughout the whole day, which means everybody in Morecambe can benefit from that kind of wider visitor distribution. But also, it doesn't max out the town in terms of just people coming in and coming out. So in terms of that's the numbers for the whole year, and I think the question was also about how much economic benefit can come as well. So um, this is the key stat. For every one pound that's invested in the project, four pounds 20 will come back to the local economy. That's 116 million pounds a year. And if you look at the statistic from David in terms of what Morecambe used to do and what Eden Project will bring, you're gonna see a significant ramp up. And in back to me not just saying that, but what's happened over the last 20 years in Eden in Cornwall. Um, we've had now, probably this year now, 21 million people since we opened came uh, come to Eden Project in Cornwall. And because we're really passionate about having a supply chain that is based in our local counties of Devon and Cornwall, and right now we achieve about 80% of that supply chain locally, that's enabled nearly two billion pounds to go back into the local economy. So this is massive for the region, and this isn't just about Morecambe or Lancashire, but when we've been working with government, this is about a new agenda of growth for the whole of the Northwest. Um, so I hope that answers people's questions. It's massively positive. Okay. And just really quickly as well, uh, in case people don't know, what's the total cost of the project and what is the breakdown in terms of where, where the funding is aimed to be coming from? Yeah, so um, with any project, you start off with a, of a kind of a funnel. You ask big, wide questions and you narrow it down. So right now, the project's looking around circa £101 million. That may go up a little bit. Conditions change. And of course, economics change about, simply speaking, how much things cost. The longer it takes, the more things can go up. That's just economic realities. 
Um, we've been really fortunate for that first level of funding. Again, people with, uh, you know, with Sue, and she knows this, but you know, I wouldn't be sat here, we wouldn't be sat here listening about Eden Project if it wasn't for the one point, or the one million pounds that was given by local partners, the city council, the county council, the local enterprise partnership, and of course the university. They were the people that were prepared to take a risk, actually, and say, we believe in you. And there's one other, the chancellor, um, not the current one, but a previous one, that was really measly and gave us 100K, but it was 100K. And that 100K has pointed to a future where the government, if you can give us 100, you can give us a damn sight more than that. So back to your question about where the rest of the money is coming from. We've been working really hard with government, working really hard lobbying. You know, the local um, previous MP, who's obviously now a candidate, has done a lot of supportive work to make sure that we've been able to engage with um, MPs, engage with parliamentarians, engage with ministers. And now that's a cross party, so whatever happens with the general election, I'm not going to be political tonight, because Eden is very apolitical, but whatever happens with the general election, we're looking for a significant amount of money to come from the government, whatever government that is, because it's the right thing to do for the North West, it's the right thing to do for investment, it's the right thing to do for this part of the world that needs to be balanced. So I think we've got the Lancashire leading. Lancashire will always lead and the world will follow. But Lancashire's going to lead, the government's going to follow. And once the government follows, then that gives confidence. And again, David brought that up about what does it mean for the seaside towns to be confident. Well, if you've got the national government coming in, you've got the local enterprise, you've got all the local people say we want this, then other investment can follow. And we're really confident we're going to chain that kind of target to get the capital investment to get this project going. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Si. Um, no, feel, feel free. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> okay. How are we doing, John? Are we, are we getting the thumbs up? That's good. Okay. So, yeah, hands in the air, as they say in dance music. Whereabouts? Down there. Okay. What's your, what's your name, please? Catherine. Catherine. Okay. What's your question, Catherine? Uh, I wanted to ask about your transport, bringing these visitors into Morecambe. Um, satellite parking and the pedestrianization of the central promenade because I think the pedestrianization of, is of course important to local businesses and transport into the town is of course very significant not only for the businesses but for residents as well and going forwards we're coming to the end of the carbon age so of course um, if we can get people in by rail that would be more advantageous well, anyone else want to pick on us first? We need to go for it. Um, it's a really important central issue for us in terms of planning, and a bit clunky at kind of 20 past 10 on a Saturday night. But this is really, really important. And the first part I'm going to raise is what you said at the end of the carbon age. That needs to happen far quicker. People need to already think about ditching the car. But there's realities around that. So in our transport strategy, this is about Lancashire County Council, the Transport Authority. They own some of the transport solutions we'd look to hook into. But again, we're not proud of the statistic at Eden that kind of 85 to 90% of our visitors come by car. That needs to change, but we're in the middle of nowhere, actually. <laughs> and it's quite remarkable that 21 million people have come to us in the middle of nowhere, and we're trying to change the model with the cars. But we can do things differently here. So to answer your question directly, in terms of coming to Eden, you won't be bringing your car. Now, we're trying to encourage people to look as part of their visitor journey, is to think from the very minute you think of coming, the sustainable approach to having a, a brilliant day out with your family is going to start with how you get to us. And we're going to make that as easy as possible, but also incentivize people to use different modes of transport. And transport doesn't have to be difficult with screaming, screaming kids in the back of the car, or maybe even screaming adults and the kids <laughs> in the front of the car, I don't know. Um, it can be joyful. You can make it experiential. You can tell a story about a different future of climate change by saying, I'm going to come to Eden Project North, and I'm going to go this route, that, I'm going to cycle, I'm going to walk, I'm going to do some different things. And for us, we work on a policy about what are you going to do to change your journey in the last two miles. Are you going to walk? Are you going to take an electric bike? And that is a great opportunity for businesses to spring up all over the place to go different travel modes and to do things differently. But we're trying to make sure that I was chatting to my version of the taxi test and the lady last night who was driving me said, but where's the car park going to go in Morecambe? There isn't going to be one. And we're deliberately doing that to make sure we're not going to have a big car park on frontier land that just sits over somewhere else. But what we are going to do is work with Lancashire County Council, County Council to bring the, 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 the threshold of transport further out. 
You've got the brilliant M6. You've got the link road. So what, what in-between land is there around Morecambe, around Lancaster, where we can create kind of a multimodal hub where different businesses can spring up? And if people are still in cars in 2023, because we're realist and they will be, then we need to provide an opportunity for that to happen. But year on year, what about 2033? It's not going to be the same. It's going to be different because it needs to be different. So I hope that answers your question. We're taking people further out. We're going to bring them in by public transport as our primary mechanism. And we'd love for the rail networks to step up and reorganize that branch line. Because isn't this the irony that this was the platform where 11 trains or 11 things used to come in here and get right to the heart? This is the gateway to Morecambe. And trains and public transport is the answer. We just need people to step up and listen. that you're then uh, taking greenfield sites? We would never take a greenfield site. There's plenty of brownfield around here that we can use. Excellent. Thank yep. you. Yep. Uh, and do you know there is a single track railway that goes to the harbour and goes round the back of Morecambe and sort of skirts the West End? We've got some pretty smart people looking all over the place to look at links that should be rejuvenated. So yeah, I'm sure that'd be one of them. Catherine, I'm still working. Am I still on? Oh, yes. Thank you. Oh yeah, okay, so we'll answer that one. So in the community conversations, it seemed to be that people believed that we wanted to close from basically here right the way down as far as the eye could see. That's not the case. And again, from Eden Project, we've taken approaches, we're here in Morecambe by invitation. And what our proposal is, is can we imagine a future whereby from potentially just in front of the Midland Hotel just here, down to Northumberland Street, effectively what gets closed for the carnival or closed for vintage by the sea, would that offer us the opportunity to create a wonderful public space, a wonderful park that effectively means you can go from Morecambe, there isn't this tarmac in the way, there isn't this sense of concrete that means the town is on one side and the bay is on the other, but a soft place for people to congregate, for families to play, and create a wonderful natural environment that isn't there before. It's part of the community conversation, and if people say, we'd love that to happen, then we'll try and do some more to make it happen. But likewise, if people say, no, no, we're really not interested in that, then likewise, we'll go away and we'll think of something differently. It's your Morecambe, and we're here to kind of maybe stimulate a few ideas and do things differently, but ultimately, it's your Morecambe. Oh, um, Catherine mentioned the pedest pedestrianisation of the promenade, just to... But that, 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 was that was answering that question. So that, okay, that's, that's, that's fine. That's anybody, anybody else? Um, anybody else got a question at all? You got this gentleman down the front. What's your name, sorry? Jason. Jason. Okay, Jason. What's your question? Who's your, who's your question? To? It doesn't, doesn't it, have to be to Sai. I know Sai has, <laughs> si has all the answers, but there's. It's less of a question, more more a sort of um, observation. We we have an opportunity here to. Uh, I, I mean, it feeds into is it Andrew? The help. Um, yeah, the, the mental health of our young people, how connected they are, that we have an opportunity here with Eden to, to be the catalyst, the, the, the sort of focal point of sort of saying, get off your devices and come to Morecambe. Come in. You cannot download the weather. And, and what we would all sort of imagine as, as the negative as 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 Cy was saying in August, where it, where the rain's coming down sideways, and the uh, and the wind's beating you, you can't download that. You have to feel it. You have to experience it to be here. Now Morecambe has its fullest range, and and Andrew will probably will probably have have surveys and charts and all sorts of things to tell you how good that taking your shoes off and walking on the sand and connecting with nature can be. It, it, it's almost like we need to have a, this, this message of get off your phone and come to Morecambe and feel, is that, is that the kind of thing we're all feeling? Because from, from listening to all of you wonderful speakers tonight, you've, you've been incredible. And this is the overarching theme that I'm feeling from you all, that we're going in the right direction with Eden, with the whole project. It, it feels fantastic. Mm. So. There's another thing that happens when um, our youngsters go on phones. They stop talking to each other. And so not only get off your phone and come and experience it, get off your phone and talk to people. Bring a sense of community back. Bring a sense of just being able to talk. 
And some, uh, you know, in doing that, then the group that we work with wouldn't have the problems that they do. They wouldn't feel lonely. They wouldn't feel isolated. They wouldn't feel they can't go and speak to someone. I've not met anyone in Lancaster and Morecambe who's not prepared to have a conversation with you. I've never known anywhere like it. You know, it's got to be better than, yeah, than anywhere. But I think, I think what you're saying is absolutely spot on. Yeah. Get off your phone. Yeah, the New Economics Foundation did a phenomenal piece of work a few years ago talking about the five ways to well-being. And they talked about the need for people to connect, for people to keep learning, for people to take notice, for people to give, um, and uh, what's the last one? Something. <laughs> eat, eat, eat well, I think. Um, what, sorry? Keep active. keep active. Thanks, Terry. You can always rely on Terry Bond. He's amazing. Um, actually, Eden gives young people the opportunity to do all of those. It gives us the opportunity to put, and actually there was some really interesting thing, an article the other day in, um, in the national press about how our own digital um, realities as adults is actually causing huge levels of anxiety in our kids because we're not present. We're not actually present for our kids because we ourselves are so distracted in the digital world. And so when our kids want to talk to us, we're often in our own devices, and it's, cute, it's, it's causing anxiety in our young people. And I think what Eden does is it allows, it invites all of us to put those things away and reconnect as communities, to build this sense of well-being, to take notice, to allow the wind to blow in your face and the sand to be between your feet, and to notice the, the, what that does to the well-being of your body. And I think this is exactly what Sue was talking about before. You know, there's going to be some changes occur in Morecambe. And it is, it's, it's about whether or not we want to be those people of critical yeast who are willing to be part of the change and say, you know, let's try something new because the reality is right now what we have isn't working for our young people. So how do we create something together that becomes so extraordinarily exciting that it gives us a new way of being, that it becomes Lancashire Leeds, the Morecambe Bay leads the way, the Bay way of being for young people becomes an international model where our kids are so well, where mental health is so flourishing in these communities because we dared to do something different. I believe we can do that together. I believe that we could create green transport. I believe that, but that means we ourselves have to take responsibility. It does mean partnerships, but we ourselves as the people also have to make different choices about how we're living, how we're spending our time, and create a social movement for real change for our young people and for the people of Morecambe Bay. And we can do that. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for that contribution, Jason. That was brilliant. Uh, anybody else? We've got... Uh, what's, your, what's your name, sorry? My name's Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you for such an informative and interesting talk this, this evening. Um, my question, again, is also around the environment. And I was wondering what environmental measures, if any, have actually been put into the build of the project? <laughs> it's not to me. Um, we, we t obviously, care. We're, we're an educational charity, but I mean, we, we started in Cornwall by actually working with at the edge of what people thought was possible at the time, and clearly working in harmony with nature. All of the people at Eden subscribe to that, and nature is perfect. You, you leave it to do its thing, and it flourishes. So therefore, everything is in balance. And therefore, if you happen to do one thing, how you balance it with another. But staying equal isn't enough. We've got to provide net gain. And um, those who are pretty well informed will know that's about biodiversity net gain. It's about what contribution is bringing Eden Project North to this place. What's it doing to add to the natural environment? Because it's not good enough just to leave the same, never alone reduce that diversity. So all of our work with Natural England, all the many groups and specialist groups around Morgan Bay, is about making sure it's not just about low impact and minimizing impact, it's how can we make a change? How can we make a difference? And if I give you one example, there's a wonderful area, the intertidal region, roosting birds. It's really, really important. And particularly for tidal flow, some of those areas, they're pretty hot spots. They're, they're, there's not enough of them, and there's large populations. And the fear is that if you're about to have a building site, never mind all the, all the, the visitors that come, what happens to those populations? And therefore, part of our scheme needs to look at providing new areas, new populations, and new places for those, uh, so those roosting birds to roost at, at different times and different seasons that are better than the ones that were there before. 
So again, we'll be working with people to try and achieve that. But that's an example, I hope, of where it's not good enough to stay the same. And all our philosophy is about net gain, improvement, increased biodiversity. And just to the lady's point about pedestrianisation, for us, it's like if we were to do this, and you were to say, we'd love you to do it with us, it'd be like a pedestrianisation like you've never seen. Because Eden brings the best of biodiversity. And I hope people know we have the National Wildflower Centre as part of Eden. So that can bring a whole other level of knowledge, expertise, bringing wild places to Morecambe and back to children and, and young people. They may have never experienced being in touch and connected with nature. So a, having a promenade with tarmac doesn't do that, but having a natural place where you feel peaceful, at one with yourself and with your community in a wonderfully abundant natural environment can do that. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah. There is, um, there is another partner that we haven't mentioned, I don't think, this evening, and that is that the foreshore is, of course, owned by the Duchy. And so the Duchy of Lancaster have been an incredibly important partner in this as well, because they want to make sure that the areas of, of um, real sensitivity in the foreshore, that we're not creating damage within there. So we will censor up the bay as much as we possibly can, because Eden Morecambe itself becomes a project that says, if you build something like this in an environment like this, what changes? What can we do to balance off those changes? And so it's not as if it's, this is going to be pour a set of concrete and then see what happens. It is very much about a staged process where we're aware that there are, there are multiple partners, but multiple areas of real sensitivity, step by step. And we won't get them all right. Of course we won't get them all right. The only people who don't fail are the people who don't try. And we will fail. On some things we will. But give us a break, because we are trying to. So I think we, thank you very much for that, Deborah. We're going to take a question from uh, over in the far corner. I don't know if this is directed to, but it's probably a general question. What provisions are being considered to ensure that the Eden project can be experienced by people from lower income backgrounds? One of the things that bothers me is this is going to be affordable for everybody irrespective of income. It's you, Sam. <laughs> You're the Eden it's man. A, it, yeah, it's a great question. And, and so we're really proud that uh, only last week we put out, for example, our Eden community weekends. So that's completely free for local populations around Eden. So, in, and, and local for us is actually Devon and Cornwall. So part of that means, A, we have completely free weekends for people in certain groups. We then also have our kind of membership schemes, and that goes local, and I said for us right now, that's Devon and Cornwall, which means you have a reduced rate for buying an annual pass that's less than we charge for our normal entry. You buy that once, you're in for the whole year. Can you imagine that in Morecambe? But likewise, it, it, back to the point of this is Morecambe's project. It's not simply taking the Cornwall model and that includes the business model, by the way, and bringing it to Morecambe. It's about being sensitive to the fact that, again, a really personal example, we support St. Petrox, which is a homeless charity. And as part of raising awareness for what was the big sleep out that happened at Eden, where members of the team and the public slept out for the night, it was no great hardship. It was one night, and that was fine. But as part of um, bringing awareness to that, there was a wax individual, a really, really lifelike individual that was a homeless person that was on a bench. And it was right outside a visitor center. For those who know me, I've got a pretty massive dog, and he <laughs> comes to work with me. And we walked past, and he turned, because he thought that was a real person. He turned, and I thought it was a real person. I wasn't in on the, the part that said, this is actually part of our publicity to sensitize people to this issue. And I turned to a colleague and said, do you know what? When we're working in, in Morecambe, this isn't going to be part of sensitizing people to an issue. This is the issue. This is actually what could happen around this place. And therefore, we need to be sensitive that when Andy talks about health outcomes for people in different parts of Morecambe, or health outcomes for different people around this bay, we need to know that that isn't anymore as it is in Cornwall, maybe across uh, uh, half a mile to two miles away. This is front and center outside our front door. So wrapping that all together, it says that we're going to give opportunities for people, whatever price points they are, to experience Eden Project North. And particularly if you're local, and we've got to define what local means, and we're working with people, what is local for you, that that means this isn't something when you walk past, you look and think, that's not for me. Eden Project is for everybody, and we're going to be true to those values of making sure Eden Project is for everyone at every price point. <laughs> Thank you.
Actually, while, while we're just talking about the finances, just a question that came in beforehand that might be appropriate to ask is, um, do you estimate that the Eden Project North will, will be profitable? In, t in, ter in terms of, I mean, I'd, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean it's, it's in terms of paying for itself and being sustainable over a long period of yeah, time. Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a really good question because it's important to say that because if you're not, you're just a problem. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to create a problem because I'm, I'm, I'm going to mention it, but we know Morecambe has been tarred in the past with things that are wonderful ideas but just couldn't sustain themselves. <laughs> the only way I'm going to answer that question is Eden Project in Cornwall has been going for 20 years, 21 million visitors, £2 billion pounds of local economy. We've kind of done this before, but we're not complacent, and we're going to be working with our business model to make sure it is completely profitable, where profit isn't a dirty word, because it means through creating profit, you can be sustainable through life. And then back to Andy's point, you can have the right revenues to support amazing jobs where people have job security, and they know they can invest, businesses can invest, and the ripple comes for everybody, so everybody gains. So yes, it is profitable, but we are a charity, and we've been putting that profit, and so for us, Profit is for purpose. Profit is for our mission. And profit means we can give more back. Okay. Thanks for that. I think John's got somebody down there in the middle. Hi. Um, well, this question might link back to what you just said, but um, I work in independent retail, and I'm really interested in whether you have a, a new vision for retail. So as I'm presuming you might have a shop in the centre. Um, and you'll be interested in supporting local businesses and small shops in Morecambe. But how does that work in terms of people are really mindful of um, consumption and single-use materials and so on, and the high street's really suffering. So I'm just wondering whether you have a new vision for Morecambe and retail. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we have, and, and it's not a, a new vision, it's our Eden vision, which is if you believe in the planet and you believe in the importance of living within the planetary boundaries, every business should have been doing this a long time ago. Mm -hmm. We've ended up in a position that should never have happened. We've all seen the resources in our planet, and bear with me on this one, as something to exploit, and therefore we've kind of taken all those things and said, now how can we use them? And one of the people we work closely with is William McDonough, who was famous for the cradle to cradle philosophy, which simply says, just recycling isn't good enough, just reusing isn't good enough, because all you're doing is the quality of those products gradually goes down and down and down. And actually, it's about taking materials and saying, how can you return these natural materials? And when they finish their life, they're still natural materials. You can plow them back into the cycle of life and they have a further use. So to answer your question, and this maybe points to a bit of getting Eden ready, don't wait if you're a business to say till 2023 to, to say how can I change my business model to be more in balance with the things that are more sustainable and have less impact. And I simply answer the question is our business model for our products, for the supply chain, for people we want to work with. We don't simply want to work with people who do less bad because that's still bad. <coughs> we want to work with people who do good. And their business model is predicated on doing good for good products, good for the planet, good for profit, <coughs> so that's also good, but also a good part of a community that all comes together. And I think that's the way we're looking to the supply chain. But we will have a shop. We are going to have all the parts that represent the components of Eden in Cornwall. But we want to know, who are the hero businesses? Likewise, who are those businesses that have never thought of going into business? And maybe through hearing us here tonight think, my God, <coughs> I want to be part of this. So please join us on this journey. And if you want to work with us, it starts today. That's the point. Make a change. It starts today. Okay. Thank you for that. Does, um, does anybody have... Uh, I just want to make sure that, uh, that the, the lovely people to my left don't feel left out. So does anybody have any questions for Vanessa about the Winter Gardens, maybe? Or to Wes about what he said about the college and education? Uh, or to David about tourism? No. <laughs> There's one here. Yeah. At the, at, the, at the back, Tom, yes? Uh, yeah, just before I hand the mic to this gentleman, just to respond to the lady um, who has a retail business, BID are just in the process of putting together a program for independent businesses in Morgan on how to get Eden ready. So if that affects you, you have any concerns about how to get Eden ready, please contact the BID and you can be part of that program, which is going to be starting in the next month or two. And I'll pass on to this gentleman now. What's your name, sir, please? Uh, Robert. Okay, Robert. It's a bit of a mixed bag question, really, because it ties into what you've been saying about transports, transport and infrastructure and what the professor's been saying about the winter gardens. As, as, as you're well aware, 
these seaside towns really got moving in the 1800s with the arrival of the railways. And everything was geared to getting people here. This station was moved about 500 yards brick by brick when they realized they could get closer to the, to the seafront as, as they sort of, the number of people grew that came here. And they built another station further down the road on Euston Road. This is now a space for uh, meetings and performances, etc. Something that could, an education, but something that could very easily be taken by the Winter Gardens to keep that as a multi-use space, which is, as, as the professor was rightly saying, is the way to keep it alive, rather than have it as a static exhibit to creak around in. This place would be far better if you could, if you could, as you, as you talk about uh, parking way out of town, bring people in on a small satellite, uh, from a small satellite station up to here. The investment wouldn't be that great. Everything's here, really. The market, as uh, many people I know who actually run stalls on there, is slowly dying, and it needs a revamp. It needs a total rethink, because... I know a number of them that are making between £25 and nothing a day, and it's just not sustainable for them anymore. This building would give people that sort of vintage seaside experience if you could persuade the powers that be to bring the rail tracks back in here. The council could maintain it as a listed building. You could bring people out on straight onto the seafront. The first thing they would see would be the Midland Hotel, the beautiful bay, the Winter Gardens, and, of course, the Eden Project. It may be worth, although it might just be a theory, it may be worth some serious consideration into reopening this because the amount of people I've seen as I'm involved with the railways who get off at Morecambe Station and think, expect to get off here. They get off at a plastic bus shelter in the middle of a concrete wasteland, which is probably the most, some of the most ill-thought-out corporate art I've ever seen. If they could come here, much grander. Start of the Morecambe experience of people who have left their cars behind. So we're talking about this place becoming a railway station again, in effect. Oh, no. what, 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 are, what are people's... So, but, yeah, so mo moving the facilities from here back to the Winter Gardens and this, yeah. this becoming yeah. the, the transport sort of hub, hub again. What, 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 are, what are your thoughts on that, Vanessa? Any, 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 any thoughts on, uh, or ever met from anybody on, on, on the gentleman's uh, point? I, I, I can't say what this building should be. I just want to talk about the Winter Gardens because that's what I know about. I don't know about what this building should be, but I think you don't want to close an entertainment venue. You want to increase more venues because you want more people to come and you want to think about increasing the audience. So, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we'll be able to fill the Winter Gardens through Eden and other things. And I think you should, should do that to every venue. You know, there's some amazing venues in Morecambe. Uh, there's some wonderful people doing up those venues as well, not just the Winter Gardens. You've got to think about all of that. Like I said, Blackpool has 25,000 theatre seats a day to fill, and we're worrying about four. Interesting point, though. Thank you very much for that. I think we're just going to take probably two more questions, I think, before we wrap things up. So, we've got this. Uh, Hi, yeah, my name's Jenny. Um, Kate, say sorry. Jenny. Jenny, sorry. Jenny, yeah. Here um, going as well. Yeah, I'm a massive supporter of the Eden Project, really excited about it. And um, a lifelong... So, I, a bit closer to me. Okay, I have... Hello, I'm... Yeah, I'm very excited about the Eden Project and um, have lots of personal experience of chronic long-term mental health problems and how connection with nature has really... Well, it saved my life, actually on multiple occasions, it saved my life. But I was talking to a friend recently about saying I was coming to this tonight and he lives in um, private rented accommodation in the West End where some of the cheapest private rented accommodation is. And he said, oh, Eden. He said, folk round here don't really like the idea of Eden because people are already coming in. And he said Manchester, I don't know why. Landlords are coming in from Manchester, they're buying up the properties and making people homeless. And I just went, and that was from someone who lives in, I have no idea if there's any truth to this whatsoever, but I just wondered if you had any thoughts or any experience or, 
you know, if that could be changed or turned around or, that, you know, that was it. Andy, you want to one? Yeah, I, I certainly can begin to answer some of that. One of the things that we are really committed to um, as part of what we call Bay Health and Care Partners, so that is the NHS, but it's also the two county councils and the three district councils and the Mental Health Trust. We are really committed to seeing housing as a major impact on health, okay? And I have to say that the work that Lancaster City Council are doing through their housing team around this very issue of the concern in the community around gentrification and the concern about the quality of housing and its impact on health and how they might work in partnership with Eden to assure members of the community that that is actually not the heart or soul of the city council to see that happen. They have put together an amazing team of people to begin working on exactly those kind of issues. Um, Eden have done an amazing job also of coming to really listen into the heart of this community through Annette's work, through Robin's work at Stanley's, through the, through the uh, Morecambe Interagency Group, through so many different pieces of engagement that they've done. And I want to just assure you that they really have heard the heart of this community. And there is a fantastic team at Lancaster City Council working in partnership with them around exactly these issues to ensure that people who live here are able to stay here and are able to enjoy the benefits of really great housing. It is something that matters really very, very much to people's health and well-being, and it matters to the future prosperity of this place. So it is really, really being looked at very seriously, and there are some fantastic people at the City Council working hard on that very agenda. Okay, thank you for that. Just going to take one more question. There's a lady at the back who's being very persistent. She's been putting her hand up all the way through. So, if we, John, if you just get the microphone to the back, um, and we'll just take the last question from, from you. What's your Hi, it's first? Robin from Stanley's Community Centre. Um, I just wondered how are we going to get ready for the level of tourism that's going to come? Because at the moment, we haven't got the amount of hotels and restaurants that we need. Or shops. <laughs> and at a time as well where this, the change with Eden coming, we've got um, the frontier land, which is now earmarked for more residential homes to go on. That, in my mind, would have been an ideal sort of place to sort of put a hotel or restaurants, because at the moment, I don't think we've got enough. I think it's really exciting, but I think we really need to concentrate our, on efforts on having somewhere for these people to come when they actually turn up. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> before, before, just before I ask the panel if you've got any thoughts on that, I mean, there was the, the, the background a little bit on the Frontierland site is that um, Opus North, the developers, uh, were looking to put a hotel and a restaurant on that site fairly recently. I think they had a deal with Premier Inn and Brewers Fair, and it, it fell through. Um, and also the plans to put a retail park on there fell through as well. But yeah, obviously they've, they've come out and said recently that any development on that site is likely to be residential-led, so you're quite right. Um, any, any thoughts on how we can prepare as, as a town for the, um, the, great, the great growth that we're hoping that we're going to get from, from Eden? From Absolutely. It's a big part of the work we're doing in terms of workforce because we're aware already acutely in terms of hospitality, catering, uh, in, in world for tourism, there's already a huge skill shortage. Um, so, funny enough, next week I'm meeting with one of Sai's colleagues to look at how we can really reinvigorate that. The problem is it's not attractive to 16-year-olds, so 16-year-olds uh, come in don't aspire necessarily to go into that hospitality, that catering, even though there's some really high-level jobs there as well, there are real opportunities for management. So I think, again, using Eden, we can sort of refocus and use a different lens in terms of what those jobs actually look like. Because, you know, I absolutely take your point in terms of facilities, but ultimately we can have the best facilities but if we can't staff them as well, then that, that's equally uh, such an important challenge. Um, if I may just come back to Jason's point, which was really important, was around the, the mental health and using nature. That's absolutely fundamental to the Morecambe Bay curriculum. So again, how, you know, how we can break what has to be delivered in the school in terms of curriculum, but do it through nature, get them out onto the beach, get the sun between the toes, using nature as a therapeutic element when it comes to, to mental health. So, Sort of a couple of answers there, but it's all part of the same drive under our Morecambe Bay curriculum. It's about how we can reinvigorate those career pathways to support that growth. Uh, and again, absolutely understand that's got to be hand in hand with the facilities, but also 
the therapeutic nature that we can use it to really tackle this epidemic of, of mental ill health that, that our young people are experiencing at the moment. Yeah, and older people. And older people, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, David, just so you get you, you get the chance to say something as well. Yeah. I mean, in your in your in your research, do, do you sort of come across any any, any particular trends that you see in, in seaside towns yeah. when, when, when they, they have like a, a big attraction come along in terms of how, to co how, they, how they cope with the, the most increased change, tourism? The most obvious change is the economic uh, restructuring. So you know, people used to come to places like Morgan for two weeks. Now, 90% more uh, people have come to Morgan come for a day. So accommodation is actually, um, its role in the whole visitor economy has changed. But uh, I was talking to, to David, um, earlier on, is what, what really I think Morgan should be aiming for the critical mass of attractions, events, and things to do to make people stay overnight. If you do that, then the visitor spending goes through the roof, and you get a lot more economic benefit to the, to the whole region. So I think you're you're right. I think you're touching on something. Hopefully, uh, the Eden Project, Eden North, will create the demand and the supply will follow. It will be relatively easy for uh, hotels and b &Bs to set up here. There might be a lag, but I, I, I understand that property prices are already going up, um, and I think people are already eyeing more and I think the development will follow. Can I, can I also say something, Brad? Because part of the message is it's a sustainability in ecology. So mm. you've got to think about how you get things ready. You've got to think about we're in a venue that's serving plastic all night, plastic cups. You know, when Eden came to the Winter Gardens, we basically said to side, recycle everything because we don't want to be doing a, an engagement project where everything is not is going to be thrown away. So you've got to yourself start thinking about that wider message of why Eden is coming here. You've got to start thinking about how your sustainable message yourself, your reusable, everything has got to be part of that message, not just about shops and hotels or businesses. Let more could be the sustainable capital of the United Kingdom. Let more can be the green capital. Let the be the fact that, you know, Morecambe has become the place where Eden has shown us that we are not going to pollute our bay anymore. We're not going to have any plastic on our bay. We're not going to have our seabirds destroyed by all the rubbish that goes in there. Yeah. That's what you've got to think about. That's what you've got to get ready for as well. Also, I think I think what Eden is creating for us is a really amazing opportunity for entrepreneurs as well. We do need to see new hotels. We do need to see new opportunities for accommodation to spring up. Um, and I think one of the things that's been really exciting for us is doing some learning from Preston on some of the economic model they've developed there about it, what I talked about a little bit earlier about anchor institutions, how big employers can actually choose to do some really exciting and innovative things. For example, take the pension pots, and instead of putting them in some offshore something, they can actually choose to put them back into local economy. And if they actually took, for example, pension pots and invested them back into new hotels for Morecambe, actually that creates economy. It also creates the sustainability in terms of the pension pot and, and allows everything to benefit. So it's, it's about maybe choosing about where we procure from, making sure we try and do things locally, driving up local economy, really choosing to believe in this area, choosing to believe in the entrepreneurs in this area, and giving them the grace and the ability to, to, to light a fire and start and try some new things. We absolutely do need to do it, but I think that there are ways that some of the bigger employers in this area, including the NHS, could choose to invest some of our resources differently to spark that kind of innovation locally and really invest in local economy. Okay, thank you. Now, we're, running, we're rapidly running out of time, so unfortunately we can't take any more questions tonight. However, I mean, I'm very conscious there may be some of you who, who may have wanted to ask a question, and uh, Sai, is there a method that people can actually get in contact with, with yourselves at Eden if there is something they want to know Yeah, about? I mean, again, so people on our, on our website now, on the back of the community consultation and conversations, we've got a questionnaire. They go onto our website, um, and there's something to, to, to really go through your thoughts, what you think about Eden Project North. So have your voice, effectively. It's time that you can put your voice into the project. Um, also, the team are up here really frequently. I'm up here uh, every month. But likewise, just to point out that Professor Rob Barrett, again, is in our kind of permanent hub, which is in Lancaster Morton College. Again, you can go there and chat to him. But generally, just be advocates of the project. And if you have got specific questions, 
You can email us, uh, I think it's edenprojectnorth at edenproject.com. Uh, we're a small team, we rumble pretty quickly and hard, but again, we'll get around to people's questions. But please, we're up here all the time. And if it's not this occasion, come to other occasions, and there will be more community conversations because this is your project, and this is going to be evolving. We've only just started, this is just the beginning. And just to wrap things up, Sai, just uh, time scales again, just to remind people, what, what, are we, what are we looking at in terms of the ideal? Yeah, um, we're, when, we're looking to, the, to, to the, the, the general elections put things back a little bit, but not too much. So we're looking at extending what we thought we'd do by probably about four to five months, or by some of that. So effectively, we're looking at having a planning application um, through um, to the city council, probably by the back end of the summer, maybe early autumn now. And if we get that through, which you know, we've got to we work diligently, not least on ecology, the environment, all the things that are really important for the bay, but we could get a planning approval then, potentially by the back end of next year, and then we could be into kind of the initial part of construction, which is site clearances by the first part, end of 2020 to 2021. Uh, and then with that as a time scale, um, we, it's a two-year build phase probably, so 2023, maybe into the, the first part of 2024. But it's all going to happen. That's the most important message. And if I can have one last word, if I'm allowed to do that. It's been an utter pleasure for all of us, I'm sure. But the biggest plea from us is please look after Chris and this project. Go out there. And every time I speak in front of people, I will say, if you go back and you tell other people, other members of your family, other people that you know, what you've heard tonight from every single one of the panel members, we grow a compelling case for change. Because that's what this really is. And Eden Project North is already here. You've heard that from Rob. Um, so, yeah, it starts today. Okay. And if there are any questions you want to ask, I'm sure that our panel will be, will be staying around afterwards as well if you want to, if you want to grab them too. Uh, but so a, a, few th a few thank yous. Well, first of all, let's, let's thank our panel for uh, some amazing information. Great talk. Dr. David Jarrett, Ed Johnson, Professor Vanessa Children, Dr. Dennis Lee Dr. Andrew Lott, and Sai Bellamy, from Eden Project International. And uh, also a, a big thank you to our hosts at the platform. Big thank you to, to Morecambe Bead as well for putting this on. Uh, don't forget tomorrow, uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, oh, you're all welcome to buy more calendars as well. And uh, you're also very welcome to join us tomorrow for the conclusion of the Morecambe Sparkle Weekend, the free Morecambe Christmas lights switch on with live music from two o'clock on the Festival Market and Craig Charles switching on the Christmas lights. And then the event at the Winter Gardens with Craig Charles, the Soul Train Christmas Party, for which tickets are still available. You can get them on the door, can you, Vanessa? You've got to get them put online. Um, watch this space. Watch this space. Watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> they will be available. You can get them. But, uh, and thank you to you as well for coming to an evening with Eden. And I hope you've really enjoyed it. Safe journey home. Thank you very much.